More than 168 million people in over 50 countries are in need of humanitarian aid. Highly violent conflicts are causing widespread hunger, displacement, human suffering, death and destruction around the world. Now more than ever, there's an acute need for skilled humanitarian manpower to match the growing need. It's time to take action and grow your career in the humanitarian sector. Welcome to Strategia Netherlands. We are an international organization that aims at making development and humanitarian work more effective. We are an independent and private provider of online and distance learning in humanitarian courses. Our mission is to provide our clients with relevant and high quality courses to propel them to the heights of their choice careers. With over 300 exciting career-focused courses to choose from at Strategia Netherlands, our students are imparted with skills that greatly increase their prospects for employment as well as value to employers. Our students work for international organizations such as the United Nations and national and international non-governmental organizations and various governments. You can now apply online for diploma and postgraduate courses with a flexible schedule that allows you to study and maintain full-time employment. Apply now for a Diploma in Monitoring and Evaluation Diploma in Conflict Management Diploma in Leadership and Management Diploma in Humanitarian Logistics Diploma in Community Development Diploma in Grant Management Diploma in Disaster Management Diploma in Water, Sanitation and Hygiene Diploma in Gender Development and Diploma in Food Security and nutrition in humanitarian emergencies. The cost for diploma courses is 800 euros, while postgraduate courses cost 1,200 euros. Visit www.strategianetherlands.eu for more information. Take action and register today. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening, uh, depending on where you're logging from. We want to welcome you to this session again. Uh, it's always good a pleasure morning. to host you. And um, my name is John Caregua. I'm the training director at Strategia Netherlands. And uh, we welcome you to this masterclass. And uh, today's guests, we have Jane uh, Muller, who is a Nemanis specialist. Uh, we have Job Moravi, who is also a Nemanis specialist. And Dr. Joyce Nguge, who is also a research and uh, m and &E specialist. Um, let's take a minute uh, for you to indicate where you're logging from. Please, please uh, show that in the chat and we can welcome you and your country. Please do that. Uh, let's take two minutes. Please uh, type in the chat. Thank you, Nairobi. Thank you very much. Uh, Adis joining from uh, Nairobi. Thank you very much. Uh, South Africa. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Geneva. Thank you. Malawi. Thank you very much. Botswana. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Adis again. Thank you very much. Um, Malawi. Thank you. Uganda. Thank you very much. Lebanon. Thank you. Lesotho. Thank you. Mali. Lebanon again. Thank you very much for joining this program. Thank you, uh, Malawi again, welcome. Uh, Sudan, South Sudan, thank you, Joseph Okam, thank you. Um, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, thank you very much. Cameroon, and thank you. 
Adisababa, thank you. Yeah, Unde Cameroon, thank you very much for joining this program. Thank you, thank you everyone. Um, the objective of this masterclass is uh, we are trying to create a community of uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, practitioners and specialists. And uh, the end result is uh, we'll be sharing our trends and knowledge and also create a forum where you can post um, uh, new case studies or findings. So this is uh, one of the first steps to create a global uh, monitoring and evaluation community. And thank you all for joining. And um, without further ado, but let me first go to, uh, to um, basic uh, rules for this program. Uh, please mute your mic so that uh, everybody is able to focus. Don't, uh, don't uh, unmute yourself uh, and allow some noise. Um, and then again, uh, during the presentation, let the facilitators finish uh, the presentations. There'll be an opportunity for uh, asking questions. So don't interrupt until the session is over. And then also um, for those who are uh, taking our courses, um, if you have any questions related to your course, uh, we could uh, create space towards the end or better still write an email to, uh, to the academics director and they'll respond to you. And also uh, the slides uh, will only be made available to our students. Uh, otherwise, um, the, uh, the recording will be on the website um, on YouTube, our YouTube channel, which is Strategia Netherlands. So uh, visit uh, Strategia Netherlands YouTube channel and you'll find uh, the recordings tomorrow, including uh, 55 other recordings uh, for the previous uh, um, webinars. Uh, so what's the program like today? Uh, we'll have the first presentation by uh, Jenny Mule, uh, which is on the introduction to monitoring and evaluation and uh, monitoring and evolution framework. Yeah. And then uh, we will have questions and answers. And then we will take a break for about uh, 10 minutes. When we come back, uh, Job uh, Murethi will come in with the theory of change and log yeah. frame um, approach for project uh, design and implementation. We'll take questions and answers from him, um, and then we'll have another break. And then we'll have the final session from uh, Dr. Joyce Ngugi. Uh, she's our seasoned um, facilitator. Uh, she will handle uh, data analysis and management and report writing. And then we'll have questions and answers, and then uh, we will uh, wind up. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Jenny to uh, start. And thank you very much for creating time. And I hope you get to learn uh, so that then uh, we can make a difference uh, in the projects and the activities that we do for our communities. Welcome very much. Thank you very much, John. As you have heard, my name is Jenny Mula. I am a facilitator. I am a consultant also. I consult in strategy, project management, and I absolutely love all things monitoring mm -hmm. and evaluation. As John has said, I will take you through the introduction of monitoring and evaluation and what that is, what monitoring and evaluation means, the importance of monitoring and evaluation and the principles of monitoring and evaluation. And then my colleagues will take it a little bit further after I am done. But before we really get into monitoring and evaluation, you know, just allow me to ask, I just want to ask in the audience and you can just uh, put up your hands how many of you, how many here have ever climbed a mountain? Has anybody here ever climbed a mountain? Yes, I can see some hands going up. Some have climbed mountains. Okay, how many have at least climbed a hill? How many people have climbed a hill? Okay, and I see there's a good number. Oh, I'm in good company. Now, let me tell you, I have climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, Mount Kilimanjaro, and I summited. What that means is I have been to the highest point 
of Africa, which is Uhuru Peak at Mount Kilimanjaro. And it's good to see that uh, some of you have climbed the mountains. Unfortunately, we do not have too much time. I would have loved to hear the stories. I want to imagine some of you have climbed uh, Mount Kenya, maybe Mount Meru and others in your countries, but it would have been so good. Please, if you have tried Everest, please, Put it on the chat. We want to see if anybody here has tried Everest. But let me just give you my story. In 2013, you know, in tw the year 2013, I decided I'm going to climb the mountain. And I joined a group of these young people here in Nairobi, Kenya, who take people to that uh, mission to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. So I signed up. Officially, the training that you need to do and the practice to get ready to summit Mount Kilimanjaro takes three months. So we were scheduled to climb the mountain about August of that year. So three months before we would have officially started the training. However, I knew myself, I was way overweight. I was about 44 years old at the time. The group that I was joining had young tax, people between about 22 and 26, 28 years old. So I was very conscious of my age. I also had very weak knees. I want to climb the mountain, but my knees keep letting me down. Now, because I knew I had this challenge, what I decided to do was at the beginning of January of 2013, I did my own program of how to start training and preparing so that by the time I joined the team on the official training program, I would at least be, you know, up to speed. <laughs> And so I hit the gym and I hit the track and I used to walk and I used to run. I was in the gym. But let me tell you something. Even when I joined the team three months before, I was still the weakest link. I was still the most unfit. I mean, you know, I, I couldn't believe it. But these were young tax anyway. Anyway, just to tell you the story that I started in January, trained and did whatever I needed to do. What was I doing throughout January until I joined the group and until we went on to climb the mountain? I was monitoring my progress. I was monitoring to see whether I was getting any fitter, any better. And I had Googled and I had learned that people do die at Mount Kilimanjaro attempting to climb the mountain. So I needed to be careful. But I was monitoring every month, every other month. I had a training program, but I had to see whether I was getting to where I was supposed to get. And even when I joined the other team, the, the leaders of the team said they kept watching me without telling me so that they could determine on the morning when we were to start the journey, whether I was actually fit to take that trip. That's how serious it was. Because if they thought I couldn't make it, they would have recommended that I don't attempt. But because I was determined and I had said I must climb a mountain, whatever be tied, what I did through from January was to keep monitoring what I was doing, the exercises I was doing, whether I was getting any fitter, evaluating what worked better for me and what didn't so that I was ready. And I'm here happy to say that eventually I was declared fit to climb and I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. Colleagues in the room, I'm telling you this story just to, for us to begin to appreciate the importance of monitoring and evaluation. Yes, monitoring is, and evaluation is a skill, is a practice, a discipline we talk about when we're talking about project management, particularly in the development space. But I would like you, by the time you come out of this webinar, to realize that we also need to do monitoring and evaluation at a personal level. The minute we see how it is useful to us personally, then we begin to appreciate and understand why it is absolutely critical when we are doing project management. Okay, and allow me now, I will begin to share my slides. And as I do that, let me just ask, when you hear monitoring and evaluation, 
what comes to your mind? And I, I wanna ask you to please go to the chat box. Don't write full sentences. Don't try to define it. Simply put the word that comes to your mind, monitoring and evaluation. What comes to your mind? If you could do that for me, I would appreciate it as I am putting up my slides. I think I see some things coming. You know, I wanna ask, uh, Regina, are you in the room? Can you read for me some of the things that you are seeing, some of the words that you are seeing coming up on the chat box? Oh, actually, that's okay. I can see them. I see tracking, follow-up, measuring progress, projects performance, donors. That's an interesting one. When you think about m and &E, I mean, it's the donors who keep requiring of us to do m and &E, collecting data. It's an ongoing process, continuous improvement, accountability, governance, good stuff. I mean, you guys generally know what this terms uh, the emotions and the feelings and the words and the thoughts that they bring to us when we hear that terminology. Uh, let me share my screen now. Can somebody, uh, I think you can see my screen only if you can't, please let me know. But there's something here. What is this on my screen? Wait a minute. Oh, good. Okay, that has gone away. So let me share this from the beginning. Thank you very much. And John did tell us what we are here for. That is my name and that is whom I am. And today I'm gonna to take you through, like I said, about the introduction of m and &E. And it's, let me just say, some of you, the term we are used to is m and &E, but it really has developed to meal, which means monitoring evaluation, adapting and learning. We won't get into all the, uh, the specifics of this, and that's why we have our diploma and certificate courses, okay? So what is the definition of m and &E? As you have said with some of the words you have put there, monitoring and evaluation is a process. It is a process where we are collecting data using different tools, different methods, different timings, but we are collecting data and we are analyzing that data. So that what? So that we may be able to measure progress towards specific goals and objectives. I had a goal, I had an objective, I was gonna get fit before I met the other group. So I needed to measure my progress towards being fit to, to be able to join the other group. And what else are we doing? We are assessing the performance of projects, institutions, and organizations. Most of the times when we talk about monitoring and evaluation, it is a term that is used in the, in the public sector, not too much in the private sector. That's a different story. We talk about audits on that other space. But here we are talking, we have projects, we have, there are things we are trying to do. If it's a government, there are programs they are running for their citizens. If it is a donor, they are trying to accomplish something for the benefit of the beneficiaries and the participants of that project. So now we are doing monitoring and evaluation to be able to assess the performance of these projects. Uh, sorry, that came too soon. And then, so what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Because we want to find out what is working and what is not. Okay, we want to find out what's working, what not, so that we can make informed decisions. You may be familiar with the terminologies, evidence-based programming. Today, it's all about programming, yes, for development, yes, to help beneficiaries and citizens, but whatever we program, whatever projects we want to undertake, we want them to be evidence-based. And therefore, we do monitoring and evaluation to collect the evidence that helps us make decisions about the future of the projects that we are doing, any new projects we're going to be undertaking, you know, many decisions are, are made. If you are in uh, Tanzania, for example, and this is a donor, maybe it's the EU in Tanzania, they have this project that they're undertaking. They're doing monitoring and evaluation also to say, should we continue with this project in the future? 
Should we take this project from Jerusalem to Dodoma to somewhere else? Should we do that? Should we scale it up and now expand to the whole of East Africa? How do they make those decisions? They will take monitoring and evaluation data to be able to make such decisions. Should they stop this project? Should they expand it a little bit? Should they spend more money on the training or on the monitoring and evaluation? Where should they spend more money? They use evidence-based which is data collected from monitoring and evaluation. So that's generally what monitoring and evaluation means. When we get more into the specifics, because yes, we always say monitoring and evaluation, but monitoring is totally different from evaluation. The two go hand in hand, but they're absolutely different. So what is monitoring? When we talk about monitoring, the, really the main thing is that it is a routine process. It is continuous. We keep doing monitoring from the time we design a project and start the implementation from January, and it's a five-year project or a three-year project, we begin to monitor right when we start implementing. One month into implementing, we are monitoring. It is routine, it is continuous. And most of the time, we are looking to identify whether there are any bottlenecks, you know, are things happening the way we said they should happen? This is what we're doing in monitoring. We said we would uh, train 100 teachers in the first year. Are we getting to the number 100? How many are we training per month? Is the curriculum that we are using adequate? Is the length of the training adequate? We are just monitoring. We said we would do it. Are we doing it? And if we are not doing it, then what are the bottlenecks? What is making us not teach, teach as many, train as many teachers as we wanted? What is, what is causing this? Why are teachers, after we train them, why aren't they using the knowledge? What, what is happening so that we can monitor what we are doing? When it comes to evaluation, it is, it is sporadic. It happens at certain times during the implementation of a project or a program. For you to do evaluation, a, a certain length of time has to have taken place because we are trying to see whether what we are doing is effective, whether it is getting us to the results that we want. We monitored whether we are training the number of teachers, but now we want to see, is that training even effective? Is it bringing a change to the teachers? Now we need to do an evaluation. So we can only do an evaluation after we have done a certain amount of time on the implementation of the activity. So it's important for us to always remember there is monitoring and there is evaluation. And you know, I, I tell a story once where uh, in a place where I worked in a donor organizations and we had this this uh, program, you know, a really big program with a lot of money and was five years and was here in Kenya in some of the counties that we were work, working with. And the end goal was to reduce poverty in those counties. Okay, so we have a program and because it's uh, mostly agricultural activities, we, we were doing a lot in the agricultural sector and getting to you know, trying to get the agricultural sector there productive and profitable so that the uh, poverty can be alleviated in that place. So that's what we were doing. And we were fairly successful in how we were implementing. We did what we said we would do. We trained the farmers. We got innovative ways of doing things. We got farmers to buy inputs at reasonable prices so that they can be successful. If all this was happening as we meant it to happen and everything was going well. Shock on us, I'm telling you, when we did an evaluation. Now the evaluation was to see whether I we were actually getting to the yeah, end goal of reducing the poverty. Shock on us. Poverty in these regions had yeah. increased. Okay, poverty had increased. So how is it that we have been implementing a program Things have been going fairly well. We are generally getting good reports from the implementers and the beneficiaries, but poverty has increased. I mean, that how could that happen? That was the million dollar question that we had. 
which means that you can implement things fairly in the way you meant it to be implemented. Everything is going according to schedule, but the, what you are doing is not leading you to the end results. And that's why we do evaluations to see whether if we continue in the way that we are continuing right now, will we get to that end result? So, and normally you will hear, uh, we have performance, performance evaluations, we have impact evaluations, and that's a just totally different new conversation. But if, uh, uh, what you need to know is most often we have midterm evaluations. So if it's a five-year project, we do a two and a half point, we do an evaluation just to make sure that we are headed in the right direction. And just to make sure that if we continue the way we are going, we will get to that end result. And then sometimes we do an end of term, end of project evaluation, just to see again, whether things totally worked the way they were supposed to work. Sometimes we are looking at whether the project is sustainable. And we also have ex post evaluations where we are doing an evaluation one year, two years after the project ended, because we wanna see whether those benefits we had, we had accrued, whether they are still continuing. Those projects, those things we started where we wanted farmers, for example, to be, uh, to have better incomes and increased produce, whether the things we did are continuing to provide the benefits. So you can do an evaluation way after the project has ended. But I hope now we, it's, it's, and for you guys, I know it's really just a reminder of the difference between monitoring and evaluation. There is another way you can think, you know, so that you can always remember the difference between monitoring and evaluation. And I'll show you this now. This is a comparison chart between monitoring and evaluation. So the first column shows you what monitoring is. The second one shows you what evaluation is. So when we are talking about monitoring, we're talking about observation. I'm just, I'm going out into the field. I have a list of things which were supposed to happen. I'm going to observe, ask questions. Did this happen? Did you do this according to this schedule? That's what monitoring else. Evaluation, on the other hand, is making a judgment. Yes, you did train. Yes, you did provide the input, but was that the right input? Did that input bring us the results we wanted? We are making a judgment, okay? And at this point, we can say, much as we are training farmers or teachers, according to the plan, it is not taking us anywhere and we can make a judgment and stop the training, okay? Then we talk about monitoring happens at operational level. It's just the operations we are implementing. It's the day-to-day -day activities. It's at that level that we are doing monitoring. But for evaluation, we are looking at it at a higher level in the organization, at the business level, where we are saying, is this even strategic? At the business level, we are looking whether what we are doing is strategic, whether it fits into everything that we want to do, and whether it fits into the bigger picture. Okay, and then monitoring is short term. It, it starts immediately. We look at it every week, every month. We are going out to the field and monitoring. It's short term. What happened this month? Next month, what happened this other month? It's short term. But evaluations, we are looking at long term. That's why we have an evaluation at the two and a half years point. So we are looking at a whole two and a half years. That's what we are doing. Monitoring is only looking at what is happening right now. Uh, monitoring, on the other hand, will most often focus on improving efficiency, you know? Um, okay, for the cost of how many teachers you're training, 20 with the same kind, you know, maybe we can train 30. Let's improve the efficiency. Let's make sure we are getting all the curriculum we need in that space of time. How efficient are we in using the money and the time and the resources and the effort that we have, right? But for evaluation, it's the effectiveness, okay? Is this thing getting us to the end result? If it is not, we drop it. If it, if it is, and at a very high rate, we may decide to increase it, okay? Because it is so effective in getting us to where we want to go, okay? And then we look at um, uh, who does the monitoring? More often than not, 
the in internal people of the organization do the monitoring. If you belong to a project team or an organization, it's, it's the staff who go out to do monitoring, okay? It's only when, you know, like in Kenya, for example, in Northern Kenya, where probably we have insecurity issues of uh, terrorism and that kind of a thing, where you would get a third party to do the monitoring for you because they know the terrain, they know the place, they come from there and you, uh, people cannot travel there, you may use a third party. But normally it is the staff of the project that do monitoring, but evaluations, are normally done by external parties. Even if a team of evaluators may include some internal staff, the team leader will almost always be an external party. Why is that? You know, we are trying to make a judgment. We are trying to improve effectiveness. If you and I have been involved in the day-to-day -day running of this project, we've been monitoring it, we may not be objective enough to see whether this thing is going to where we intend it to, to go. Particularly if monitoring is showing us that we are fairly effective. Every time we go out to monitor, we come back happy. Things are going the way they, they are supposed to go. We are on track. We are looking at the work plan. Everything is going according to order. We may not be objective enough to see whether what we're doing is actually effective and therefore, um, evaluations are normally done by external parties. I do know, for example, uh, uh, folks like USAID, as long as it is a required evaluation, then it must be done by external uh, contractors, okay? And then when we talk about the data used, monitoring, we use the data, the data short term. You can literally go out this month, do some monitoring, and by the time you come back to the office, you can change something. You know, you can change something in the short term so that by the time we go out to train teachers in the next uh, in the next month we've changed something so it is short term but for evaluations it's long term okay because we we have had enough time to look at the effectiveness of what we are doing and now the change we are going to make is also with an aim to change a long-term things. We are doing an evaluation at two and a half years. We are making decisions now, and we want to change the direction in which we are going for the next two and a half years, not for the next month, okay? So that's, that's, that. this is a table that would help you understand and quickly know and differentiate what monitoring and evaluation is, okay? Are we together? Uh, let me, uh, you know, I want to stop sharing just for a second and check with everybody in the room. Uh, are we are we together? And I want to, you know, I, I'm hearing absolutely no noise, nothing. So can somebody, oh, Miss June, I see you in the room. Can you put up your hand if you're following and you're hearing me well? Could you do that, please? Loud and clear. Good. Okay, loud and clear. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so but let me let me go back. You have a question on the chat. I have a question on the chat. I think we were told to wait until the end, but not a problem. Not a problem. If it's only one, maybe I can look at that. Aha! Uh -huh. Oh, you know what? What is the question? Uh huh. Let me see the question. Uh, if it's not the last one. Oh, you are too fast. Oh my dear. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Efficiency is doing things right. Effectiveness is doing the right things. Thank you, Job. That's, that's absolutely uh, correct. Efficiency is doing things right. So we are monitoring and we are seeing whether we are doing things according to the work plan. But effectiveness, the evaluation, is telling us whether we are even doing the right thing. That's what it is. Unfortunately, I cannot see the question, maybe it's buried down in the chat, uh, but you will have a chance to ask it at the end. And with that, let me just continue with my presentation. Uh, so no worries, please note your questions, we will get to them. So, you know, again, let me just, we're talking about monitoring and evaluation, and I keep talking about projects and programs. So what's the relationship? What is the connection? And this chart, with, which is borrowed 
from USAID. I think for me, this is one of the best diagrams, you know, uh, visual aid to see what a whole program cycle looks like. And this is what a program cycle would look like, where you always start at the top with a country or a regional strategic plan. If you work for government, you know that the government will, at any one time, it's working within a five-year plan. For most donors also, they work within a five-year plan. Now, the five-year plan for donors, for example, uh, let's say we are talking about um, who are the donors that, that uh, one of the donors, let's say USAID are donors. So they have their own country back home in the US. They have a strategic plan for development. And then they bring it down and customize it to say the developing countries. They have a strategic plan for the development countries. When they come down to Kenya, they again have to draw down that and make a strategic plan for Kenya. So that's where the program cycle will always start from. The top, the strategic plan for a country, a region, we have a plan. Then after that, we begin to design the projects, okay? Within one goal of the country, the overall goal, let's say, you know, to reduce poverty for the citizens of Kenya, then we begin to have many other projects. We'll have a project under agriculture, under governance, and um, uh, under governance, under health, under uh, uh, food for peace, under environment. There will be different projects that are all feeding in to get the goal of the country. From there, after we design the projects and we begin to implement the projects, then we come and design the activities. The project is, let's take an example of um, an early, early, uh, early uh, reading activity for young, for grade ones and two, right? We want them to know how to read and write. That becomes the project. But how many activities are we going to have? A myriad of them. We're going to have a, an activity to train the teachers, an activity to buy the books, to set the curriculum, to um, sensitive, sensitize the parents, work with the community, work with the health sector, because we need to take care of the health of the child so that they can actually go to school so that they can learn to read and write. Then there will be an activity to do with governance, an activity to work with the government. So we design the activities and begin to implement the activities. And there is when monitoring and evaluation sets in. And you can see monitoring comes first and then we do the evaluation. So this is the place of m and &E in, in the program cycle or in the project cycle, okay? Please notice that right in the middle of this is results. The big circle in the middle is the results. Everything we are doing is for specific results. We are not designing projects for the sake, okay? The We can't hear you, Janie. Yeah, she seems to have some problem with connectivity now. Yes. Um, let me go on and find out what's happening, probably uh, internet. Um, Thank you, John. Meanwhile, um, I'm back. All right. Okay. Oh, that, that was interesting. No idea what happened there. But so what I was saying is because we have results in the middle, we do not monitor and evaluate, evaluate for that sake. We monitor and evaluate to get certain information to help us make decisions that will lead us to the results. That is why we do monitoring and evaluation, okay? So it's never for its own sake. Okay, that's where I was. So what are the main purposes? of monitoring and evaluation. Exactly why do we do monitoring and evaluation and particularly evaluations? Monitoring, yes, we monitor, you monitor, you monitor what you're doing, you monitor your goals, 
why in development do we have to do particularly evaluations? Okay, and I'll tell you two main reasons. One of them is accountability and transparency. Colleagues, donors have given us money. This is the taxpayer's money. Somebody somewhere in that country is laboring and working, is being taxed, and that money is coming to developing countries to do development projects. We need to be accountable for these funds. So that's why evaluations are done, okay? To measure the effectiveness, the relevance, the efficiency of the projects that we are doing. And also we do evaluations to share those findings with all the stakeholders. When the EU comes to Kenya, how many stakeholders are there? We have the government, we have other implementing partners, even other donors are interested in what the EU is doing, the citizens. So evaluations are done so that we can be accountable, okay? And then we get a lot of money. So, so, so much money is sent, say, for example, to any one country, to Zambia. You know, I have no idea what the development budget there is, but let's assume the uh, USAID comes with six, $600 million to spend in Zambia for development. How do they decide whether we, do we use all of it for agriculture, for health? How do they make decisions? Evaluations help in deciding where those, that those funds are, are given and in making decisions within programming. And then of course it's learning. When we do evaluations, a lot of knowledge is generated, okay? And particularly, of course, an organization will do evaluations to learn themselves as an organization, to learn as the project and the programs they are doing. But I think for me, what I like best is that uh, the, uh, these days, the practice these days, and I'm, I hope it's the same where you work, is that whatever evaluation you do, you share that report and, and all the information and the results and the findings, you share them somewhere in a global database so that we can all learn you know, globally that all the health folks are learning and picking lessons from each other's countries. So that what? We don't repeat the same mistakes, right? We don't reinvent the wheel. Okay, um, learning also helps, for example, if again, the EU in Tanzania has a project in Tanzania, it's a pilot project. They want to see whether this, you know, this innovative and creative idea is working in Tanzania and for the developing countries. So they test it in Tanzania, do evaluations, learn some lessons so that when they scale it up to Kenya and to Uganda and wherever else, they, they are informed, they know what works, and what doesn't work. So learning is another key, uh, key purpose for doing monitoring and evaluation, okay? Um, moving along, so what is the importance? What is the importance of doing monitoring and evaluation? And, and you know, for this one, I wanna pause for a minute and ask you, just go to the chat, give one word. Why is it important to do monitoring and evaluation? If somebody can just uh, say something on the chat and I'm waiting to see, why is it important? Why don't we just get the money from the donors, you know, maybe program a few things, design a few things, and just take the money down to the communities wherever it's needed, you know, do what we are doing, Come finish the money, come back, get some more and continue. Why do we need to do monitoring and evaluation? Anybody for accountability of how we are using the donor money for impact? We wanna see whether we are having impact or not. Otherwise we, you know, we are spending money and there's no impact. So it's really a waste of the money. Uh, why else do we need to do monitoring and evaluation? For improvements, yes, we make decisions to improve. Value for money, yes. Let's see whether we can get the most that we can get out of the money to learn, to see if the program is moving as planned for future reference, for public approval, for future grant applications, absolutely, to make the right decisions, to measure impact, uh, institute corrective measures, measure the difference that the project is making, very good. Um, uh, better resource allocation, gain new insights, absolutely. So these are the reasons why we do m and &E. And so let me just go down again, the list of the importance of doing m and &E. And some of you have said it, you know, it's only when we do monitoring and evaluation that we consolidate 
that information about the project progress, okay? If, if we don't do money, because we do monitoring and evaluation, and you're gonna hear about this in the afternoon from my colleague, when she's gonna talk about um, report writing for monitoring and evaluation. When we do m &E, we do reports. So this learning, this information about the progress of this is consolidated in a certain place. If we didn't do m and &E, Yes, you and I will go to the field. Yes, we will learn something, but where is this lessons? Where is the showcase showing us the progress? So m and &E helps us with that. You know, we learn from each other's experiences. You do an evaluation for your project, I do mine. We share it in the cloud somewhere. We go to workshops, uh, uh, evaluation uh, findings are presented. We learn from one another. We build our expertise, okay? It generates written reports. I've said that for transparency and accountability. It reveals mistakes in the path that we are taking. You know, what it, in this work plan, we came up with at the beginning when we did the design. What, what's the problem? Could there be a problem here? So whatever mistakes we have done in this, in this, uh, in the right from the designing to the implementation, we get to see this when we do ME, and then we can make improvements. Okay. It provides a basis for questioning and testing assumptions. We have to go to the field, do some monitoring, and see whether those assumptions we thought, you know, we said that. Uh, we'll do a project for early grade uh, learning, uh, reading and writing, but we made an assumption that the government would come up with policies that would favor that project. When we go to do monitoring and evaluation, we will find out whether that assumption we made, whether it is holding, okay? Because if it is not, if our whole project was reliant and dependent on the government coming up with the right policies, our whole project could collapse, okay? So we question and test assumptions. Uh, you know, it, it helps us to, to develop practices and procedures. When you go to our website of, the, you know, say the Dutch and how they do the development and, and the Japanese and everybody else, how did they come about with their processes and procedures? It is out of monitoring and evaluation, okay? And then we, we find a way to assess, to assess the crucial link between implementers and beneficiaries on the ground. Another whole conversation where you and I probably work in the donor organizations or the implementing partners, and then we have the beneficiaries. How do we link the two? Because you know it's, it's now old fashioned. We no longer have the mentality that we are the donors, we have the money and you need our money, you're the beneficiaries. So we just give it to you and you have no say in how to use the money. That, that narrative has now changed. Now we bring the beneficiaries, if you would, who we now call fellow partners, we bring them into the, con into the conversations of what we are doing, okay? And how do we do that? It is in the space of monitoring and evaluation. Uh, monitoring and evaluation also helps us to retain and develop institutional memory. I mean, can you imagine, you know, think about it yourself, wherever it is your work, you're an m and &E specialist, and then you've collected all this data, you get another job, you go, and you go with everything that you have learned, right? But if we do m and &E, then we have it documented, we have it on paper, and other people can read and follow through. And then, of course, like we said, you are going back to the donor for more funds. You're applying for grants. How do you prove that you can manage this grants how do you say yes in zambia you've been giving us 600 uh, 600 what what did i say million a thousand dollars now we want double of that how do you justify that it is through monitoring and evaluation okay and then of course m and &E also helps to influence the development or the refining of, of policies by government or by the, the donor countries. So they, you know, the policies they come up with are based on evidence, based on monitoring and evaluation, okay? So this is generally the, the importance of m and &E. This is generally what monitoring and evaluation does. I wanna stop there for a minute and I wanna, uh, I think, uh, maybe I'll take another, just a few more minutes, but is there a question or begin to think of a question and I will quickly, I'll quickly go to my last slide, uh, my last or second last slide, and then I will take questions. So just begin to think about your experience, um, you know, your experience in the monitoring and evaluation space, given what I am saying, and then think about those questions. But 
um, let, let me now take a minute to talk about the principles, the principles of monitoring and evaluation. What are the principles of monitoring and evaluation? I will share that right now. We have seen why they are so important, right? We've seen why monitoring is important. So monitoring and evaluation is then based on certain principles. We said, as I showed you the diagram, everything we do is for the sake of the results. So we have to do m and &E properly. And this on the screen is generally what the principles of uh, uh, proper monitoring and evaluation are. Number one, monitoring and evaluation has to be timely. Okay, it's got to be timely. We are using this to make a decision. If I need to make a decision uh, by December of this year, and you tell me that you're going to do the evaluation next year, that doesn't help. Uh -uh. So it's got to be timely. The reason why monitoring is done almost every month or almost two, every two months, depending, is because we need to make those corrective decisions and measures immediately. So it's got to be timely, okay? Interesting enough that we talk about monitoring and evaluation. And at the beginning, I said, it's normally, it's monitoring, evaluation, adapting, and learning, okay? So monitoring and evaluation has to be adaptive. We are looking for information that will help us to adapt. We are looking for lessons learned so that we can adapt, so that we can use that information to make adaptive correction. Now, the monitoring and evaluation structures and frameworks that we come up with also have to be adaptive. As we begin to monitor and evaluate, that process of monitoring and evaluation, we have to be able to adapt even as we are monitoring, okay? So that's an important principle of m and &E. And then it has to be empowering, right? We are talking about the people who are, are tasked with doing monitoring and evaluation, for example, in your own organization, they have to be empowered to be able to do the monitoring and evaluation and to be able to influence decision-making. So they have to be empowered. Empowerment also would come with participatory where we are talking about when we're doing m and &E, we need to bring in the beneficiaries also right? They need to participate in the process of monitoring and evaluation, and we need to empower them so that they are able to make decisions that affect themselves, okay? Monitoring and evaluation, you'll also come to realize, has to be focused. The space of what you can do when you come out of your office and go to the field to do monitoring or evaluation, the breadth of the information you can collect and you know what you can look at, which questions you are you can ask. There is a myriad of them, but for it to be useful to us, it's got to be focused. We are asking this particular questions because we need to know this particular information to make this particular decision. Okay, and then ME has to be kept simple. It has to be kept simple. If we complicate it too much, then it, it gets too complicated. We won't get the information we need at the time that we need it. And then of course, everything we are doing in monitoring and evaluation is so that it can be useful. It's gonna be timely, adaptive, empowering, focused, participatory, sim simple, so that we can use that information, okay? One of the reasons why projects fail is because monitoring has been done, evaluations have been done, but all that information is in the shelf and we don't take the time to action on the information that we are getting, okay? So monitoring and evaluation has to be useful, otherwise we are wasting our time, okay? And then uh, I think then that now becomes my last slide, the principles of monitoring and evaluation. So uh, let's take a few minutes. Let's take a, you know, uh, uh, 10 minutes probably, and I believe John will allow us that. Let's take some minutes and now you, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or put it on the chat. I think now I see what's the difference between effects of m and &E and advantages of m and &E? It's one of the course module questions. Okay, we are getting into theory here. What's the difference between the effects of m and &E and the advantages of m and &E? 
Now that's an interesting one. And can somebody who wants to try and answer that question? Uh, but okay, and I take I see that. And then let me see another one. What are the key points to consider when developing an ME2 uh, for project evaluation? I want to believe, let me just see. I think uh, my colleague is coming after me and is going to be talking about data collection and data collection tools. And that's where that answer is going to be answered. That question will be answered. Uh, let me see another one for uh, what are the tools used to carry out ME that is coming after me? What are the beneficiaries? How are the beneficiaries engaged in the ME process? We're going to talk about that. Uh, okay, <laughs> somebody never gets enough of listening to me, Maha. That's a, that is interesting. But so, what's the difference between the effects of monitoring and the what was the question again? Was it the the effects and something. Anyway, I see Miss Junior hand is up. If you would, uh, it, my hand is up for a question later on. But uh, I can, okay, I okay, can give you difference. Uh huh. Um, I think one difference is based on scope. Monitoring looks at day-to-day -day activities. And uh, evaluation looks at um, the overall deliverable from uh, based on the objectives and output. So I would say one difference is based on scope. Right. Right. Because the scope of monitoring, the scope of monitoring is to see whether we are implementing as per schedule. Okay. That's the scope of monitoring. Are we are we implementing the way we said we would? However, evaluation, the scope of evaluation is to say, as somebody had put it on the chat, are we even doing the right thing? Okay. Uh, yes, we are doing according to scope, but is it even the right thing? Right? So yes, scope will help you define uh, define monitoring and evaluation. Um uh, what was the other question? Uh, many uh, information that may be used today may be used tomorrow. Why are you saying many information not used is useless? You know that is that's interesting, Vincent. Um, many information that may not be used today may be used tomorrow. That is correct. Now let me ask you this, Vincent, and anyway for all of us, really, we are implementing a five-year project. Okay, the monitoring and evaluation we are doing is for this specific project. At the middle of the project, at two and a half years, we want to make a decision whether, for example, whether we should add more money into this project. We want to make a decision whether, and this was according to plan, when we were designing the project, we had said that after two and a half years, we will then make the decision whether to put more money. We will also make the decision whether to go into more counties. For example, if you're in Kenya, we started the project in five counties. We want to go up to 15 counties by the end of five years. So in two and a half years, we need to make the decision whether we should now move to other counties, okay? So we have done monitoring and evaluation. Say, for example, the evaluation is done on the fourth year. We have one more year to go. Normally, during the last year, we begin to do closeout. So this report and this information that we collect on because of the fourth year evaluation, not that it's useless, but it has not come on time. We needed to make these decisions last year. We are getting the information now. We've already moved on. We either made the decision to go to another county or to add more money, not based on any evidence, which is not the right way to do projects. So yes, will somebody else next year or after this project is done, will somebody else pick this evaluation report, read it and get some useful information? Absolutely, absolutely. Because you know any evaluation question, any data collected can be useful. But to the point of the principles of m and &E is it's got to be timely. We need this information when we need it, when we want to make a decision, okay? So nothing is ever totally useless, but it it's not serving us in this particular project, okay? Um, 
Now, I've forgotten the question, I'd read the advantages of m and &E highlight the specific benefits organizations can gain, included improved, right, 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 right. Thank you very much. That's an input. Uh -huh. There was a question I said I would use, you know, there was a question. Let me just, um, yeah, is somebody trying to say something? Let me, there's a question I read that I felt was, how are the beneficiaries engaged in the m and &E process, okay? It is also, uh, uh, you know, the latest thinking, and when I talk about the latest, it's actually now a couple of years uh, where I had said that, th you know, before when donors came to a country and we who work in the donor organizations or, or in government, um, we had the mentality that we have the money, we give it to the beneficiaries. It was like, it was transactional. We give you the money, you use it, you report back to us. But that's, you know, evidence, again, evidence has showed that if you want your program to be effective, if you want the buy-in of the beneficiaries, then you need to involve them. So how do you do that? You know, uh, some of you here may be familiar with the terms collaboration, learning, and adapted. So number one, you want to collaborate with the beneficiaries, which means what? When you are designing your projects, you want beneficiaries represented at the table. Okay, when you and I in our organizations begin to design a project, we think about what's the problem there. You and I are looking at it, we are seated in the offices, we are looking at that community and, find, and thinking what is the problem there. So we bring the beneficiaries to the table to refine and define and further articulate what that problem is. So that's how we involve them, right from the design of the project. Now, when we start coming to monitoring, we also involve them. When we are deciding what questions are we gonna ask, we involve the beneficiaries representatives at the table. When we go out to the field, and I remember when I was working, for example, at USAID now, when we went to the field to do monitoring, we carried representatives of the women groups, the youth group to go out and monitor with us, okay? First of all, because there are things, the context, they understand more than we do, Okay, so even as you're working with them in the process, they clarify many things for you. Also, there is the information they want to find out themselves. They want to know why this project is working there for this youth group and not this other one. You need to work with them for the buy-in. Okay, so uh, uh, when you go, sometimes when we did the actual evaluations, even though we had an external party carrying out the evaluations, we could ask for a representative of the beneficiaries to be in the evaluation team, or at least to work with them out there in the field. That's how you involved these folks. Wherever you're making these conversations, have uh, beneficiaries represented. After the data is collected and you come back and you're validating the information, bringing the beneficiaries on the table so that they can see whether what the evaluators are saying, whether they agree with it because they're the ones on the ground, okay? And I hope that answers you a little bit. Uh, so beneficiaries are collaborators and subjects at the same time. Mm mean, yeah, uh, you know, I want to say yes, first of all, uh, because it's a yes or no question. However, you, we really, in development, what, you, you know, the term subjects shouldn't even be, shouldn't even be arising. Just that I, I get what you're saying, um, uh, who's, who, who's some, I get what you're saying, but the term beneficiaries subjects is even a little bit um, not very, very good. So, but they are collaborators, they are partners. Think about it like this. So what if I have the money, if I'm, you know, I'm the donor, I bring the money to, uh, to the country, I have the money. What, 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 what worth is my money if I don't have the participation of the communities? What worth is it? So they really are partners when you think about it. You know, I want to help the development in a developing country. They are my partners. I can do nothing without them. And particularly, um, and this has happened to some of us, you go to a community with your money and, you, and they say, absolutely not. We, ne we do not want your money, mainly because probably of the attitudes with which we come down to them, okay? Um, okay, you know, this have moved so fast. Um, you know, John may tell us of another way we will address these questions. Probably they'll all be copied. I can respond to them. And as the recording is shared, the answers can also be shared. But, you know, Edith, I see your hand up. 
uh, and I think I have like 10 more minutes probably. Edith, you wanna go next? Thank you, Jenny. Uh, thank you for the very nice uh, session. I appreciate it, very insightful. Um, I, I, mine was just, I don't know if it's a question or a comment, but there's something that I've noticed in practice about m and &E and especially for the staff, either m and &E specialist or for co-person or officers that do m and &E for development work or for nonprofits. I, I don't know if it's the wrong assumption, <laughs> but I've noticed it uh, for, for, for quite some time now that the function tends to separate itself from the entire program. So when the person is hired, they tend to, to do their role as M and E officers. Yes, they do the monitoring. Yes, they do the evaluations. They present reports. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's a bit of detachment. There's no synergy with them understanding the, the entire project papers. Because if you're going to, to collect data to a beneficiary, I believe you need to really understand the context firstly, even as you're evaluating, you put yourself in it. So I, I, I tend to see what I've seen over really in, 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 in quite so many uh, places is they do the role really well, collect the data, but these, they don't blend in into the actual, they're interested in the data as yes, qualitative and quantitative, but the actual heart of this beneficiary to sit down and understand why is this thing working and why is it not working and making recommendations that are aligned to improve with, with really an understanding of, of of the before, for example, it's a baseline, yes, but do you understand the context and, and the processes? So I, I, have, I have seen this happening in the m &E function that they present findings and data, but they're not at the heart of the project and, and everything. So I don't know what you would recommend for someone who is in that function or who intends to do the course, but I, I really think we need to, they need to be, I, I would use an example of a project officer. The project officer will do the, the, the monitoring and everything, but eventually the M&E officer will do the whole uh, perhaps evaluation and maybe they may take part, but the judgments or the findings of the M&E specialist external and internal will, will carry more weight because they have the, the, the technical knowledge. Right, right. Yeah, Edith, and thank you so much for bringing that up. I mean, that's that's the reality on the ground, right? Where you have, and it stands for exactly what you're saying, but even another way it shows up in the organizations is when that M&E function in the organization is not, is more, a lot often not even adequately staffed and not adequately re, uh, resourced, you know, the, the budget for that is not even there now. So this, this, this is the thing, and the, and, the, and the question, the comment has many uh, aspects to it, but this is the thing, let's start with, you know, when we are doing the designing of the project, and what Edith is saying is that we design the project, we begin to implement it, and then we bring this m and &E folks there, right, and we say go to the field and collect the data, and they don't, they don't even know where we were coming from, they don't know where this all started. And that is why the thinking today is, you know, when you are designing a project, if you are in this room and you're more of the project uh, designer, you've got to have the m and &E people seated on the table. They've got to be on the table right from the beginning. To Edith's point, how do I now come to start monitoring and evaluating? And I was never in the conversations, okay? I have said it before in these courses where we say, and if you are the m and &E person who feels a little bit alienated from the project itself, you have to increase the volume of your voice in the organization. Every time you hear them, talking about designing a project, you've got to fight for your space on the table. You've got to say somebody in the m and &E department absolutely needs to be on that table, okay? At USAID now, what they are doing here, right out in the field, is every every um, every project design team has has a list of who the main uh, team members must be. There is the core team members, and there is you know the, any other person who maybe comes on later on. Before the M and E folks would come later on. Now, in the very core. 
there's got to be somebody of the m and &E specialist because not only do they need to have the understanding of where this project came from, but they also have to help you in the designing because sometimes the designers, you know, it's so excited with the problem and the solutions and they know what they're gonna do. It takes an m and &E person to tell you, how are you gonna measure that? You're talking about things that cannot be measured or that will be too expensive to measure. So you wanna tweak that design a little bit, okay? However, because life is life, and sometimes the M&E person might be hired after the designing and implementation has started, so that the orientation of this new person has to be from the history of where this project came from. Where have we been coming from? What was the design of the, you know, what was the design? Why was the, why was this the thinking before they can do, go out and do M&E? Absolutely, Edith, Edith, M&E is not a standalone, you know, that we can just, I, I come into your organization and just pick it and run with it. No, it's got to be fully uh, collaborated into the rest of the process, okay? Uh, John, uh, uh, let me take four more minutes. Uh, Vincent, if you would, and then we go to June. And those are the hands that I can see. Uh, Vincent? Yeah, thank you so much uh, for the good presentation, Jane. Um, I was just uh, wondering, uh, I think you made a point that monitoring is for internal, internal staff and uh, uh, evaluation for external experts. Uh, I just wanted to pick your minds. If you have a mega organization, say it's a non-government organization whose headquarters is, say, in the case of Zambia here in Osaka, but it has got projects uh, in all maybe the 10 provinces of the country, and they want to do an evaluation for one of the projects in one of the provinces, in one of the districts. Can they, can we say if they picked the experts at head office who are heading the monitoring and evaluation division qualified to evaluate a project in the outskirts of the country and can they be called external or they need to really come out of uh, that organization altogether? Yeah, that, that's a good question. You know, I wanna say that when, particularly when we talk about the internal staff, we are mainly talking about the people that are working within this particular project, okay? So you're talking about the project manage, manager, the project coordinator, you know, the person responsible for making decisions, the one signing off on the vouchers, on the financial vouchers for payments, the people who are really, you know, it's it's in their day-to-day -day work, they're working on this project. So we, we therefore say, when they go to evaluate it, it's a, it's a bit tricky and challenging to be objective. But yes, you know, for example, um, you know, you're talking about the head office at Lusaka and the projects being out in the in the communities out there. Yes, absolutely, because this person seated in Lusaka is not involved in the day to day. So I guess it's you'd have to look at the nuances of you know, if I am the one who approved the project, I'm seated in the head office, and I also make decisions uh, on that project out there, again, I might be biased, particularly if it has anything to do with, if, if I go out, if, if the evaluation of the project and the results of the evaluation of the project, if in any way, I think it says about my management skills and how well I'm working on this project, that I'm definitely not the right person to evaluate, even if I'm at the head office, okay? Because I will, I will be biased. I want to show that this project is effective and very good because I had something to do with the design. Okay, there is a different kind of head office to your to your scenario where let's say if it was, you know, the Dutch, that it's the Dutch, the donors are the Dutch, they're the ones who are bringing in the money, and we are talking about the m and &E folks in the head office in Netherlands now coming out to evaluate this. The biasness is now getting way far removed. They are not involved in the day to day. They make decisions on how to use and allocate funds. So for those ones, yes, they can come and lead that evaluation. Uh, do you get my point? You see, I've seen it yeah, sometimes. Sure. 
Yeah, and if we were to have in your organization, for example, if we are to have candid conversations, and the minute you tell me, you know what, Jenny, you're just here in head office, you lead that evaluation. I should be able to say, uh, you know what, I can do it, but you know, I like that, I like that project so much. I think we are doing so well. If I go to evaluate it, I'm only going to see the th good things. Okay, so those kind of candid conversations would help. Uh, John, allow me to just take one question from June, and then I'll absolutely hand it back to you, June. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Janie. I never tire listening to you. And I just want to go back to a question that was raised by Clement, asking uh, the difference between efficiency and effectiveness. And uh, there's Job who said efficiency is doing things right. Effectiveness is doing the right thing. But um, in my brain, I'm asking, when do you determine something is right? And why I'm saying that, I'm remembering um, the story you gave us about a program you were involved in that was looking at poverty, looking at agriculture, and how to decrease the levels of poverty. And you con did your, did your M and E, and then at the end of the day, you found um, that the, the objectives were not being met. So now from that, I ask myself, is this really the difference between efficiency and effectiveness? Right, the doing right mm -hmm. and doing the right thing. Because for me, those definitions define a leader vis-a-vis -vis a manager. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, June. And you know, you know, maybe, June. Allow me to say, just so that everybody knows, June first comes from the. We can't hear you. We've lost her again. Um. Yes, we have. But I can delve uh, a bit to say effectiveness would come in in terms of uh, uh, is a strategy working, is a strategy effective, while efficiency would be um, is the project getting value for money. Uh, I think those those are the, the that's a whole difference, uh, um, and I don't know if. Um, uh, Job, are you there? Can you expound further? Since uh, you're also an expert in this area, as wait for uh, Jenny to come back. Yes, and I'm back, and I'm oh, sorry. And maybe that's, right, thank yeah, you. Yeah, maybe that this is a sign that I really must stop now, right? But uh, yeah, so June. Um, um, evaluations gets us to the effectiveness because we said we could monitor what we are doing and we are generally, we are doing the right thing. I mean, we are doing it. We trained enough teachers, you know, at the right time, no problem. But when we see the end result that we wanted to see to get that result in the middle, we realized that t uh, training the teachers was not the right thing to do. The thing we really needed to do was train the government officials. Okay, mm -hmm. to get us where we are going. But uh, now what I wanted to really get at is what you, your last comment, your last question, and that, and now it's 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 uh, threatening to escape me. Oh, to my the project I use as an example. Uh, first of all, the end the 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 end of that story is that when you are developing a project, okay, when you're designing a project mm -hmm. and you want to claim that that you whatever you're doing is leading to a certain result, you need to be careful how you, how you word and what, what that end result is. Now we came to realize that no one donor in a developing country can really make the changes of reducing poverty. It, there is so much involved in that, that conversation about the poverty of the people that no one organization can really uh, do the effects, right? So we could come in with a project. We are doing the, we are doing things right. We are almost doing the right. We are in this case, in terms of effectiveness, we are kind of doing the right thing. But 
what affects the poverty levels of people. It has to do with the country's GDP. It has so much to do with the government and what the government is doing. It has so much to do with health and other things that we could not honestly and genuinely have tried to take responsibility to reduce poverty in a certain place, okay? So this also has to do with the assumptions. And that's where sometimes you as a project, you are doing things efficiently. You are almost doing things effectively. But what you did not do is you did not take care of the assumptions. The assumptions were things beyond your control. So while Russ, you did the right thing, and you did it correctly, the assumptions did not hold. We thought that uh, as we were working on the agricultural part and everything, the government policies, the private sector, the banks and everybody would give loans to the farmers, would do this kind of thing. And those assumptions did not hold, okay? So June, what I'm trying to do here in just a minute is to, is to impress on you, maybe time uh, did not allow, but to impress on you that yes, we can measure efficiency and effectiveness. And that's what we do in evaluations by asking the right questions. Um, if we ask the right questions, get the right team, put enough effort and time, we can measure effectiveness, okay? And sometimes how this shows up is we have a program that has many projects. And then uh, when we are doing monitoring, all the projects seem to be going as planned. However, the evaluation shows that this particular project is not effective in getting us to the results. So we may drop this after two years, take that money, put it in these other ones because it's these other projects that are getting us to the end result. And I'm sorry, I've had to say that very quickly and really summarize it, but that's what it is. And we can measure effectiveness and efficiencies. Um, uh, guests and colleagues, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and uh, your listening ears. I've absolutely had uh, a good time. I hope you have gotten as much as you wished to. And with that, back to you, John. Thank you very much, um, Jenny. I think uh, this is uh, adult learning methodologies. So we'll take a 10 minutes break. And no, then no, no. Uh, when you come back, uh, Job Murethi will take us through a theory of change, um, logical framework in project design and implementation. And then uh, we'll take the next session. So please, let's take 10 minutes break, grab your coffee, and we come back um, in 10 minutes. I'll keep counting. Thank you very much for your patience.
mà đây là mình nghĩ mình kèm rồi anh làm cái này So, right, uh, welcome back. Uh, it's uh, 10 John. minutes past, so I take this opportunity to invite uh, Job Muraidi to do the next presentation. Job is a Nemani specialist and is going to handle um, theory of change and uh, uh, logical framework, logical approach in uh, project design and implementation. So Job, welcome and uh, thank you very much for your patience. Job? Hi everybody. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Job Kinyo Morevi. I'm an MD um, uh, and uh, research and learning consultant. And I'll be taking you through um, a few topics in MD. I know, I know we don't have a lot of time, but um, we'll try to cover as much as possible with the allocated time. So um, let me share my screen. Yeah, so um, let's go into, <clears throat> I hope my screen is visible. Someone confirm? Yes, it is, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, all yeah right. I see. All right, thank you, thank you. Okay, yeah. yeah. So today we'll be covering um, um, uh, a few areas, uh, data collection and indicators, the logical framework and um, the theory of change. And um, thank you very much to Jane um to Jenny because she has done a very good job at introducing this topic so I'll just pick up from where she left so in the first part we'll cover data collection and uh, indicators and um we begin with data collection um there is no MD without data collection that one is um a fact when you talk about MD you have to talk about data collection so we'll be looking at the kind of uh, data collection um, what it is what it involves why we do it the kind of data that you can collect um, and what tools you're going to use to collect that data so data collection in m and is um, considered a systematic process systematic because it's very orderly and then um, it is um, uh, the process by which we gather uh, we gather information and evidence um, to do a few things, we want to gather the data and evidence because we want to measure, we want to track, and we want to assess um, the progress that the project is making in different areas. Therefore, the purpose of um, uh, data collection, why we collect data in m and is because we want to, um, to inform decision-making using reliable and um, relevant evidence. We want to learn, we want to be, uh, and also want to be accountable to our stakeholders. And um, Jenny has really talked um, at length about that the aspect of accountability. So um, we're also collecting data so that we can help our stakeholders um, to understand, including ourselves as um, the project team, um, to, uh, to understand whether we are on track in terms of um, the activities we're implementing and whether we are likely to achieve their desired outcomes um, and objectives that um, the project intends to. So that, that is um, a brief introduction to data collection and why it's important in MD. So um, the data collection methods, um, we have uh, mainly two types of um, data collection. The first kind of data collection, we call it primary data collection. And the uh, second one is called secondary data collection. In terms of primary data collection, um, it refers to um, when we are collecting data for the first time, and um, this data that you're collecting is very original in nature. And um, a further disaggregation of uh, primary data collection, um, we have two kinds of data that you can collect here. The first kind of data is qualitative data, and the second type of data you can collect in, uh, uh, is quantitative data. Um, qualitative data, most of you know, um, is um, data that exists in terms of uh, descriptives and uh, narratives. 
while quantitative data um, exists in terms of uh, numbers or num numericals. So um, qualitative data, you can collect them uh, using in-depth interviews. You can collect them on online forums. You can collect these qualitative data also from groups. You can use web, web uh, survey charts, and you can also use other online communities to collect this data. For the quantitative data, um, you can collect it face-to-face, -face, um, and we'll talk about some of the methods and tools you can use. You can collect the data quantitative online through mail or even through a phone, um, uh, through phone. So the secondary data collection is the second part of um, data collection. And this refers to data that is already collected by someone else. Um, you're not the one doing, uh, going to collect that data yourself or interacting with, um, um, with the respondents to collect that data. And this data can exist in different forms um, in government publications, for example, like the uh, household surveys, the census data, ETC. It can exist in websites. From a simple internet search, you can get a lot of data online. Um, it can exist in books, in articles, journal articles, and in newspapers and magazines, and even, even the uh, project data. It can exist even in terms of the reports that the project is um, uh, compiling. So um, I ended us also to look at um, data collection methods and tools. Um, and we're going to um, follow, follow through the two kinds of data we talked about, the quantitative data uh, and the qualitative data. So for the quantitative data, if you want to collect data that is existing in terms of numbers or numericals, you can use different techniques. And uh, one of them is survey. Um, and when you're using a survey, um, you can use tools such as Google Forms, um, SurveyMonkey, um, you can even collect this data using Quatrix, um, Kobo Collect, ODK, and all these other, uh, all these tools. If you want to uh, collect quantitative data using an experiment as your technical method, then you can use tools such as um, um, softwares that have been specially designed to collect experimental data, or um, the researcher can also uh, uh, design their own tools to collect this kind of data. The third technique in terms of collecting quantitative data that you can use is observation. And normally the tools used here in observation are video, audio recording devices. You can also use checklists and you can use also coding schemes. And then the data that is existing, and um, I will give an example, for example, the household data, household survey data and the census data that is already existing data. If you want to collect that data or uh, make an analysis of that data, you can use statistical software and uh, data mining tools such as um, rapid miner. So those are the uh, techniques that used to collect quantitative data. If you want to collect quantitative data, you can use techniques such as uh, interviews. And in interviews, if you want to collect data using uh, interviews as your technique, you can use digital voice recorders, interview protocols, and not taking tools. You can also use another technique in terms of collecting quantitative data. And these are, we call it um, focus group discussions. And you can use device, recording devices, moderator guide, and not taking tools. You can also use uh, case studies to collect qualitative data. And uh, the tools we use here are interview guides, observation protocols, and document analysis templates. Another form of um, qualitative data that you can, uh, um, you can collect is from documents. And we usually call it document analysis. And do you, when you're doing document analysis, you can uh, use document review templates highlighting tools and um, content analysis software. We're going to talk about it much later. For example, that uh, this content analysis software for qualitative data. And then finally, um, another technique you can use to collect qualitative data is ethnography. And in ethnography, you can use um, tools such as field notes, um, audio recording devices, and interview guides. Um, and then there's something called mixed method. Mixed method is um, refers to um, a scenario where you want to collect both qualitative and quantitative data. Okay. Um, can someone mute? Okay. So um, <clears throat> mixed methods um, is a combination of uh, qualitative and quantitative um, uh, techniques in terms of data collection. And it is usually fronted because it uh, ensures um, you achieve something called triangulation. And triangulation um, is um, um, uh, um, guarantees the rigor and, um, uh, and comprehensive data collection. 
So if you want to demonstrate that you've um, been thorough and rigor in terms of um, how you're collecting your data, it is advisable you combine both quantitative and qualitative uh, means of data collection. Um, and then um, um, I just th uh, thought of um, briefly also taking you through um, um, how you can collect data in terms of the tools and technologies that are available or at our disposal. Some of these, um, are of course, open access, they are free to everybody. And some of them are, um, are um, you have to pay for them. So if you want to collect data using um, your mobile phone, uh, mobile devices, such as smartphones or, or tablets, um, you can use tools such as um, Kobo, uh, ODK Collect, Comcare, and Survey CTO. This is just a few tools that you can use. If you want to collect your data using web surveys, uh, web-based surveys, you can use tools such as uh, Google Forms, Survey Monkey Type Form. Um, if you want to collect data that is uh, geographic in, in nature, um, for example, um, if you're implementing a development project that is uh, focusing on health and you want to know maybe um, a, uh, a cholera, cholera, cholera outbreak um, where it's um, happening and which part of the, of the community is happening uh, mostly, you can collect that data using geographic information systems. And tools here, um, uh, softwares here you can use, uh, include ArcGIS, QGIS, and Google Earth. Um, and you can even use this data to demonstrate that maybe a part of the community even was uh, um, um, got a particular uh, service. One, another part did not, uh, like demonstrating even disparities with this kind of data. Um, if you want to uh, collect data in social media, um, you can uh, use um, tools such as Hotsuit, uh, Brandwatch, and Sprout Social. These, these tools, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure most of you um, are not aware of this is also, um, you can use social, social media to monitor your um, either audience or beneficiaries, and you can use such tools. And these tools will help you to analyze uh, uh, public sentiments, trends, or even feedback. Um, going on, um, I know um, the next uh, facilitator, Dr. Tari, will cover um, comprehensively on data analysis tools. Um, but for starters, uh, your, the data analysis tools that once you've collected your data and you want to analyze that data, um, depending on the kind of data you've collected, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, would require different tools. For qualitative data, um, you would have to analyze using um, NVivo um, as an example um, of a tool, Atlas, uh, and even Dedos. If you collected quantitative data and you want to analyze that quantitative data, you can use um, MS Excel, um, the simple Excel. Um, it has very advanced features for analysis. Um, you can also use uh, statistical software such as uh, SPSS and Stata, and even um, programming languages such as R and Python can be used to, um, to do analysis for quantitative data. Now, once you analyze that data and you want to visualize it, you want to present it to um, to your audience or stakeholders in a, in a way that is um, um, easy to understand, you can use tools such as uh, Tableau, um, Power BI, and Google Data Studio. So these are some of the tools and technologies that you can use um, in data collection, analysis, and visualization. So um, I want to go into indicators, but I don't know if there are any uh, quick questions on that um, that I can take on data collection. I can take uh, two quick questions. Okay, then um, we, we, uh, you can type in your questions and then we can um, always um, revisit. So also wanted to talk about indicators and um, in m and indicators are very, very important, especially when you're talking about um, um, tracking your, uh, your inputs, um, um, if you're tracking your inputs, your outputs, um, the project uh, outcomes that you're developing and things like that, um, indicators are very important. And indicators, um, by the end of this, a uh, few slides are going to understand what indicators are and why they are very important in m and So indicators, um, they're defined as uh, measures that are used to track progress and assess achievements. So we are we are implementing a particular project, yes. But how do we know that we are making progress? What are what measurements have we 
um, what measurements have we put in place to ensure that once you collect the data, the data is able to assess progress and even give us even a, 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 an overview of our performance. You have to use indicators. So they provide a basis uh, for, for which we measure progress, for which we can know whether we are succeeding in what we are trying to do, and um, whether there are any challenges that um, um, we are facing. And all these are very important because they help us in informing, uh, um, in making decisions, like informing the decisions that you're going to make moving forward. Like are we instituting correcting actions? Um, are we um, increasing the funding? Um, are we um, uh, um, reassessing our strategies and things like that? So that's why indicators are very important. And these are some of the indicators that are there in M&D. Um, the list is really um, um, long, but I just um, want to take you through a few of the indicators. And you can have input indicators, and input indicators would measure the resources investment. For example, an example of an input indicator would be um, amount of funding um, that has gone into a project, that is an indicator that would tell you whether um, you, whether a particular project is, has gotten this much money. Um, for example, if we wanted to give uh, 500,000 uh, 500, US dollars to a particular project, and you have an indicator like amount of funding, at any, at any one particular time of the project implementation, you can look at um, the amount of funding you've received and to tell you um, we've gotten maybe 250,000 or 300,000, and we are yet to get um, maybe 200,000 or, or the difference. Um, another uh, input indicator is staff time, like how much, um, how much uh, time that the staff are putting into the project. And this is also important. You can have like full-time staff and you can have part-time staff. And also these would also um, even um, be important even in terms of cal cal calculation of their remuneration or even materials. Like um, if you're building a classroom, for example, um, what are the number of, uh, of uh, bags of cement that you put in um, and how much and vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the size of the classroom and things like that. And then you can have output indicators and output indicators would measure the direct results of, the, of, the, of, um, of a project, of, of an uh, input. For example, if you are conducting an activity like training, um, an output indicator would be the number of who have been trained or the number of sessions that the training has um, has incorporated, or even um, if, there, if, you're, um, if you're producing something, uh, for example, IC materials, what are the number of my IC materials that you produced? Those are output indicators. So they just measure the direct output, uh, the direct uh, um, result of an activity. And then you have outcome indicators and outcome indicators will measure the significant changes of a project. Um, and I saw even in the chat, someone asked about outcome harvesting. Um, outcome harvesting um, would, um, um, uh, would be very important when you're, when you're um, coming up with uh, outcome indicators. Um, outcome indicators, they measure the significant changes. And, and following the example I gave, for example, if you're conducting a training, um, they have been trained. Uh, for example, the community health workers have been trained. Um, then um, what changes do we expect to see based on their, of, of their training? We expect, for example, to see a more uh, um, uh, increase in demand for health services at the community level. And you can have an outcome indicator like that. Um, um, uh, the change in behavior, maybe now there is more, uh, people are uh, uh, um, seeking um, health services more um, or things like that. Those are outcome indicators. When you, when you see like a significant change, especially in behavior, um, you can come up with an outcome indicator to measure that. And then you have process indicators and process indicators will just tell us like how well are we doing in terms of the, of the project. Like um, if, um, um, if it was that community health workers uh, um, example, now the uh, community, has, community members have been referred to a health center, but are they satisfied? What, what is the quality of the services that they're getting there? Um, if we were delivering something, what is it, was it delivered on time? Um, if we are engaging stakeholders, who, what stakeholders are we engaging and what level are we engaging them? Those, those um, will tell us um, about how the process that we have in place and how we are doing in terms of that, those processes, whether we are doing them right or whether we need to, um, to improve. And then we have impact indicators and impact indicators would measure the long-term uh, effects of our project. Um, we know impact um, is usually um, felt um, a, a long after the project has ended. 
So the lasting changes, the ones that are enduring, um, you can you can have an impact indicator to measure to measure that. Um, and then those are just types of indicators. Um, and then um, in M and D, you will hear um, people talk about smart indicators. Some people talk about uh, indicators that have uh, the cream criteria. Some that have the spiced criteria. So we're just going to look at some of these criteria. Like when you're developing an indicator, how do you know that this indicator is going to be effective? So um, the first criteria that is usually out there is um, is SMART, SMART indicators. And SMART is an acronym for specific. Um, the first S is specific, and then um, M is measurable, A is achievable, R is relevant, and T is time bound. And I've given you um, in that table an example for each of them. For example, when you talk about um, an, an indicator that is specific, it should be clearly defined. Um, and, and, uh, and I should just um, uh, measure what it intends to measure and not anything else. It shouldn't be ambiguous. It should just be specific to that particular, um, um, uh, to that particular uh, outcome or, in, or input or, or process that is trying to measure. And a good example is that one there, increase, uh, increase the literacy rate among children aged six to 10 in the target region. So you can see it's very specific. Um, it talks about uh, a literacy rate. That one is very measurable. It talks about only children aged six to 10 years and in a particular area. So it can be a county, a state, a district, a, um, or even a region. Um, and then um, in terms of measurable, um, it uh, because the main goal of us developing an indicator is to measure. So it has to have that ability to measure. And, uh, and a good example is the one that um, talks about 10% increase. So we're not just talking about increase blindly. It has to be, uh, we have defined the increase to be 10%. That's what we want to achieve. And then um, achievable, um, it has to be realistic. It shouldn't be like um, an indicator that is um, uh, out of this world. It has to be something that is very realistic. Um, an example is implement a targeted literacy program with trained teachers and appropriate learning materials. That is something you can, that is very realistic, it's achievable. And then it has to be relevant. Um, relevant is important because um, oh, 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 we want indicators that are relevant to the objectives of the project. So um, if, for example, the project wanted to um, uh, improve access to education, you can have an indicator that, like, that measures that particular um, efforts that you're making towards that. And then time bound, it has to be, uh, you have to say like um, um, the period, the time period that this indicator will be measuring. Like a good example is a 10% increase in literacy rate by the end of the calendar year. So, um, and this calendar year it could be 2018, 2019, or or, or um, even 2020. Like a particular, a very specific period of time. Um, that is smart um, as a criteria, and then we have cream. Um, cream is also a criteria um, that is usually um, fronted to be used in um, in selection of a good performance indicator. So when you want to develop indicators that measure your performance, you have to use this criteria for you to know that they are very they are going to be very effective. And cream again is an acronym for the first is clear, R is relevant, E is economic, A is adequate, and M is monit monitorable. So um, um, for a good performance indicator has to be very clear um, in terms of uh, preciseness. And a good example is the number of new customer registrations per month. So if, if this project maybe was um, um, had these as one of the, um, of the objectives, then you have defined that indicator to measure performance. And then another, Another uh, very clear indicator that can measure performance is percentage of employees who have completed mandatory training modules. The indicator um, has to be relevant. Um, and a good example is um, uh, 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 in terms of uh, appropriateness uh, to the subject and evaluation, um, is the number of new customers we have acquired, um, of new customers we have acquired as a company, for example, within a specific time period. You, you see that to tell us about how we are performing or um, employee turnover rate within an organization, like how many uh, employees maybe um, are leaving or for one reason or another, are we uh, retaining employees or things like that. Another um, 
the factor is economic. It has to be obtained at a very reasonable cost so that it doesn't cost, uh, uh, give a necessary cost or cost a, ne a necessary um, amount to of or funding to the project. And then it has to be adequate. It has to provide sufficient information on performance. And again, um, uh, and again, it has to be easily monitored. And those are some of the examples. And uh, you're going to have a look at them um, um, once the presentation is shared with you. Um, SPICE, uh, we talk about SPICE indicators, and this one focus, um, focuses on how indicators should be used rather than how it should be developed. So when, it, when you hear someone talked about SPICE indicators, it means um, this person is more concerned about how indicators should be used and not how they are developed. Um, okay, just a minute. Okay, sorry for that. Uh, spice indicators, um, um, if you want to know you're using your indicators right, they have to have this criteria of spice and the first S is subjective. Um, and this one just, um, um, this one emphasizes that quantitative data is important, yes, but you also have to have qualitative data in terms of getting new insights and unique insights into how your project is doing. You have to gather them in a participatory manner um, and participatory, Again, um, Jenny has talked about it in depth. Um, just ensure that you're engaging the key stakeholders, including the beneficiaries and communities. Again, it has to be interpreted and communicable. Um, because you're going to present these indicators to different stakeholders, you have to, it have to be ex uh, um, explained and interpreted for different stakeholders to understand. The way you're going to explain this indicator, for example, to a mamamboga, or, or sorry, to, um, I forget, we have uh, students who may not know Mamboga, like to a woman um, selling at um, a small a small scale uh, farmer or a small scale business lady. The same way you explain that indicator is not the same way you explain that indicator to an executive, uh, maybe director or CEO. Um, so it has to be um, explained and interpreted, interpreted. And then it has to be cross-checked and compared uh, for you to ensure thoroughness and validity it has to ensure that you have to ensure that you're comparing different indicators uh, and you're using different methods of data collection as they are talked. It has to be empowering. Um, the indicators you're developing um, should be empowering in themselves um, in such a, a way that once you communicate to a particular stakeholder, um, it, it empowers them, it gives them, um, um, it builds them in a way. Um, and then it has to be diverse and disaggregated. And, and this one, M&D, we usually encourage to disaggregate our indicators um, across different uh, uh, um, uh, criteria like gender, age groups, um, ethnicities, and so on and so on. Um, I, I, just something to mark there. Um, this criteria that we talked about, SPICE, um, can be used because um, can be used with other, the other criteria, either SMART or CRIM, because this one just complements the other. Okay, and then um, I have to go to the second part of this, but I don't know if you have any questions so far. Um, let me just check. Yeah, um, so it seems like the, they are very quick in explanation, but we don't know whether we will get this note after the lab share. It could be better. Um, yes. Um, I think. Um, Karegwa uh, talked about sharing the slides with the students. We, we um, I, I can take a few questions. Regarding the so, sharing of the slides, uh, we can share with our students subject to the approval of the facilitators because it's copyrighted material. But we'll look into that later. But um, again, we say that this video is being recorded and will be on our YouTube channel tomorrow. So you can follow through. Um, after this presentation, but to we'll look into that later. Continue a job. Okay. Um, I, I I don't know if someone, uh, I, I cannot see any hand raised. Is there anyone who has raised their hand who wants to pose a question? Job, okay. there are some questions in the chat. Okay. Um, please read all the questions for me. Just a minute. 
All right, thanks. Okay, Loku asks, um, how do you use SPSS for data analysis? Um, for that one, um, Loku, um, there is a training for SPSS that you need to undergo um, for you to be able to know how to manipulate your data and analyze it in SPSS. But SPSS is a statistical software that analyzes um, quantitative data, um, but you need some training to, to be able to use it. Thanks, okay. Next. Milka asks, between techniques and tools, where do questionnaires and checklists fall under? Um, those falls under tools. Um, for example, when you talk about the survey, and um, I'd mentioned you can use tools such as uh, Google, Google Forms. In Google Forms, is a software, but um, the questionnaire itself is the one that you're going to deploy on Google Forms. So questionnaire is a tool um, that you can, uh, you can deploy in either in a manual way, like in paper form, or you can deploy it um, online or through software such as ODK, Collect, um, Kobo, and so on and so on. Okay. Ruach asks, will you provide the notes to us later? I think uh, we we'll to that. Karamoko, what should we understand for data quality assurance? Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for that. For data quality, um, there are usually um, um, characteristics of um, data quality. And um, sorry, I didn't take you through that, but um, there's usually I think six or seven, um, like ensuring the data is complete, um, ensuring there is no um, error of omission or commission um, or things like that. Um, I, can, I can prepare a slide on this just before sharing with Caregua on data quality um, so that um, um, I, can, I can beef up this presentation for you. Okay. Vincent asks, can we call process indicators activity indicators following the results chain elements? Um, I don't think that's right. Um, there cannot be activity indicators. Um, they, are, they are output indicators. An output indicator would measure um, the direct results of an activity. So, a process indicator is different from an output indicator in the sense that it tells you about the process, not, not the activity, but how the like how, the how, not the what. It tells you the how. The how the process that was involved, was it of quality? Was it did you encounter any challenges and things like that? But activity, you can just conduct an activity, like I've given you an example. You can do a training, you've done with the activity, yes. But you need a process indicator to be able to tell you whether, for example, how the training went. Um, were people um, satisfied? For example, were the participants satisfied? They feel the content was useful and things like that. So it's really more about the process rather than the activity. Yes, next. Okay, Loku asks, when are we doing the training for SPSS? Okay, I think um, Kariba will handle that. Okay, those are the questions for now. All right. Then we pick up the next if there are any. All right. Okay, okay. Thank you a lot, uh, Jun. Is it Jun? Welcome. Thank you a lot. Welcome. Okay, so I um, wanted to cover um, logical framework approach. And um, uh, uh, there, let me begin by saying there are different approaches uh, to m and um, and there are quite a number. But the logical framework approach is an approach that has not gone away. You know, like it has become, since it was developed in the 1970s, um, I think by USAID, this framework has become very, very important in, in uh, a lot of projects, um, almost uh, how many decades later? Is it five or six? six almost six decades later. Um, it's still a very, very, very um, critical part of most projects. And most projects will use this framework to um, communicate what they're trying to do and how they're going to do it. So the logical framework approach in, in M&D is, um, is a structured and systematic um, uh, project management tool. Sorry? 
Um, it is a structured and systematic uh, uh, project management tool. Um, it is a tool that is able to, um, uh, it is used in terms of designing the projects, um, implementing the projects, and it can be used to monitor the project and even tell you uh, in terms of uh, when you're conducting the evaluation, it can provide you with very, very critical information that you're going to use. The purpose of a logical uh, framework, um, it is to ensure that the project is well planned, well managed, um, and achieves its goals. So it's, it, 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 um, it is like um, a guide to ensuring that at any one point, anyone, any, any person can come into the project, they can be able to tell what, are we, what is this project trying to achieve? How are we going to achieve it? What has been, what is the progress of uh, the activities and what, how are they contributing to the outputs and outcomes and things like that. So um, very, very important, the logical framework approach. And um, um, the major, the, the, the tool that is um, usually um, attached to the logical framework approach is called the log frame. The log frame is a tool that is usually in the logical framework approach. It is called a log frame. Some call it um, a logical framework matrix but this all the same, it is it refers to the same thing. And um, the log frame is uh, what you can see on your screen, that table that is on the, on the right. Um, it has um, something called um, um, vertical logic and horizontal logic. Um, vertical logic, um, I don't know if you can see my arrow. Vertical logic is um, um, the logic refers to what, what I'm pointing, the blue part, yeah? Like how you move from the goal to the purpose, the output to the activities, there have to be a logic. And then the horizontal logic is, um, I think this is brown or, or, or something, this color. Um, it talked about now the product description, the objectively verifiable indicators, the sources of information or means of verification and assumptions or risks. So it has the horizontal logic and the vertical logic. And they're going to see what all these encompass and why they're important, yeah? So the, for the vertical logic, um, it has a goal, and the goal is um, the greater why. Like, and and even you can be um, you can be implementing a project, but the goal you're contributing to, you're not the only one uh, trying to achieve that goal. For example, if um, there is um, a HIV project um, you're implementing, for example, for the community health workers, and you want to reduce um, the mortality and morbidity rate for HIV in the country. If that, if that could be the goal, you trying to achieve the um, morbidity and mortality rates for HIV in the country, but you are not the only one doing that. There are so many other people who are also contributing to that, to that goal. So um, it is a broader uh, um, impact that you're trying to, to achieve. So sometimes it's called goal, sometimes people put it as impact. So um, depending on the different organizations, but it is a bigger uh, contribution, the bigger goal that you're trying to contribute to. And then um, there's purpose. The next uh, on the vertical uh, logic is purpose. The next item is purpose. And purpose, sometimes the people, other organizations call it outcome. And this one is just the immediate development outcome that you're trying to achieve. Now this one, um, you can achieve it. It should be within your purview to achieve it as a project. And then, um, um, and then there is um, output. And outputs, as I, I talked about the output indicator, it is just the direct result of the activity. And then the last bit is the activities. So, um, so you have activities that contribute to output, outputs that contribute to outcomes or purpose, and then outcomes that contribute to goal. And that is the vertical logic. Like one builds, uh, contributes to the next, to the next until you get the goal. Um, for the horizontal logic, we have the um, project description. The description, um, just, uh, um, it is just a narrative. It is a narrative of uh, what you have here. For example, if it is a goal, what is that goal? If it is a purpose, what is that purpose or outcome? With the output, what is that output? That is what you're going to incorporate in the description. And then you have the indicators and, and other organizations call them objective, objectively verifiable indicators. These are now the means um, following that uh, presentation I've made uh, um, uh, before about indicators, like how will you measure that you've achieved this goal? How will you measure that you've achieved this outcome? So, and um, you remember we talked about um, the criteria for good indicators. You have to ensure that they have 
they are smart or they are meeting the CRIM indicator. Um, that is very, very important in terms of developing of indicators to measure the, 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 um, the respective either goal, purpose, outputs or activities. Um, and, and you're going to realize here um, for, um, for the question I think Loco had asked about why, uh, whether we, we have an activity indicator. Uh, you can see here um, for the, under the uh, verifiable indicators, we do not have activity indicator, but you can have something called the means, like um, uh, what will you require or the input that you're going to, uh, for example, if you want to train people or community health volunteers, what do you require? You require um, maybe um, um, the trainer, the facilitator, you require um, the, the notebooks and things like that. So you put all that here. And then um, you can input the cost, but it's not mandatory. Sometimes uh, log frames can incorporate the cost that you require, sometimes not, um, depending on different organizations. Uh, but that brings us to the next uh, column. Um, and you talked about the sources and means of verification. So we've talked about indicators that you're going to use to know that you're achieving your goal or purpose or whatever. But now how will you verify? Like what will be the means of verification? And this one you can have, for example, um, if it is, uh, for example, the HIV one, you can have the, uh, the health survey that shows that. Um, if you have like, um, you can have health records, like anything that can be used to verify that whatever you're saying you've achieved, you've achieved it. If you can have, for example, uh, even reports, the training reports, for example, for the, uh, for the output. Um, um, I've given an example of an outcome here. You can have like the health records that shows, for example, um, um, uh, there is increase in demand for health services at the community level um, and things like that. And then for the activities, and then, sorry. Sorry, sorry for that. Um, yeah, so, um, so what are the uh, records or um, how we can verify that the um, indicator that you're trying to measure have been achieved or not. Now that one um, is called the means of verification. That's what you put here. Either the health survey, for example, the health records, it could be a training report, um, um, uh, the, or, or if you're developing a training curriculum, the curriculum itself, that is what you're going to, uh, to indicate here. And then the assumption is, um, is um, the conditions that are, without, um, are not in your control, yeah? The conditions that are not in your control, but can affect your project. For example, um, you can intend to achieve um, uh, to train people in your community, for example, but um, that community, in one, in, because of one reason or another, they have conflicts or they are fighting, so you cannot be able to train them. So the assumption here you're going to indicate is that the community will be uh, peaceful or throughout the project period. So that is not within your control, but it can affect your project. And that's what you indicate in your assumptions. Um, in terms of um, um, developing the logical framework, um, I'm saying um, I need to quicken because of time. So in terms of developing your logical framework, what you do first, um, you go top down. You develop your goal first, and then you come up with purpose, and then you come up with the output and then come up with the activities. And then once you've done that, you've gone top down, you now do a cross. You, once you've now, for example, you come up with your goal, how will you, um, what are the indicators for measuring that goal? What are the means of verification for that goal? Um, what are the assumptions for that goal? And, that, and that's um, how you work across. And then once you've worked across, you now, uh, you go through something called bottom up. And bottom up says, the logic of the bottom up is, if I have achieved, uh, if, if there is, for example, training that I'm supposed to do, and these assumptions holds that there is going to be peace in that, particular, um, in that particular community, then I will achieve this output. I'm going to have like 20 trained community health workers. And then once I have 20 trained community health workers, 
and there's the assumption that um, 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 there is maybe there's no uh, attrition for the community of the workers, then I'm able to achieve uh, maybe uh, um, increase in demand for health services at the community level. Once I've achieved increase in demand at the community level, and the assumption that um, uh, the facility, for example, is going to be operational and providing all the services, uh, uh, um, uh, maybe with the, uh, uh, all the services required or with has enough doctors or nurses or things like that. If that assumption holds, then I'm going to achieve my goal. So once you, you, you've, you've done your top down and then you've done your horizontal, you have to make sense of your log, of your log frame and it has to make sense. Like the activity I do, if I do this activity and these assumptions hold, then I achieve this. And then the same. If these outputs um, is achieved and this assumption holds, then I get my, my outcome or my purpose, etc. Et so that's how you develop your log frame. And I just wanted to show you examples of log frames. Um, this one is a, um, an example of a, of a logical framework um, I mean, uh, depicted in terms of, a, of, a, of um, a diagram. Yeah, You can see there is an activity here that these people are trying to do. OK. Assuming we're developing this uh, log frame, we would start with we want improved sexual health in a particular community. Because we want this sexual health to be improved in a particular community, what what um, what must happen for that to happen? Community members should be aware of family planning practices, and community members must use these contraceptives. And then now you go down and say, for me to achieve that the community members are aware of family planning practices, what, uh, what needs to happen? The nurses should have a better understanding and then they share their knowledge with community members. And then similarly, for us to achieve that, we have to develop a, a training curriculum for nurses on family planning and then train these nurses on family planning. So once you do these two activities, then we are able to achieve this output. Once this output is achieved, they're able to achieve this outcome. And, 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 and goes on and on and on. So that's an example. Another one um, that is now in the format of a table is this one. Um, you can see um, uh, the overall objective for this particular uh, project was improving the quality of life in this region. And that's a good example of uh, an objective that a goal that is uh, um, uh, has contributed to by multiple project, uh, projects or project partners, yeah? So, once, you, how, uh, once uh, you want to improve the project of life, what indicator do you have to demonstrate that you have improved the project of life? We are going to see, uh, we are targeting 20% increase in the income level in X region in two years. And then how will I verify that? You'll do an impact analysis. Right. And then um, for you to achieve that, you have uh, the objective here again is improving the horticultural production in terms of quality and productivity. And then the indicator at the end of the project, the horticulture project will reach 400 hectares. The productivity will increase by 20%. So you can see like it's very specific. It is a smart indicator. At the end of the project, that could be maybe three years, um, the horticulture land will reach very specific 400 hectares and the productivity will increase by 20%. And then how will we verify that? You have the um, records from the Ministry of Agriculture on land use and production. The assumption here is that uh, you need to have enough demand and price level for the additional production and goes on and on and on. And you're going to see uh, some of these examples of, um, of, uh, of a log frame. Um, and then um, let me combine that part with this part of the theory of change. Um, I wish you had more time because um, these, are very, um, um, these are very heavy topics, but um, we'll cover what we can. So, um, Recently, in M and D, there's there's been this thing they call the log, uh, the uh, theory of change. It borrows a lot from the log frame, um, but it is in a way an improvement of the log frame. And uh, some donors um, are, are are going the way of the theory of change, and you will see what the theory of change is, and um, how how to develop a theory of change. So, um, a theory of change. You can see the word uh, theory of change uh, has uh, the theory and the change part. And what is a theory? A theory is an explanation of some aspects in the world based on knowledge that has been confirmed through research. That is a theory, yeah? 
Um, so it is an explanation, but that explanation is based on knowledge that has been confirmed through research. And then what is change? Change is transition, it's transformation, is an alteration uh, in, the, in, the, in the state of, of, of a condition or, or condition or something, yeah? So um, this um, uh, uh, diagram I put here was to demonstrate change, yeah? Change is you, you have a seed, you put it in the soil, it grows um, to the level of becoming a tree, yeah? But starts from a seed. So if you wanted to develop a theory of change, for this particular diagram, I would say, my theory of change is this, yeah? If I have a seed, this first part, if I have a seed and I put it in the soil and I water it, then it will grow and develop to a tree. That is my theory of change. That is how I'm seeing things will work. But when I go to the ground, when I come now to implement this particular theory of change of mind, it may not hold because I can put my seed in here, yes. And um, I can put it in the ground, but the environment around it is not conducive for the tree to grow. I can even water it, yes. But for example, if I've not fenced the place, um, animals come and eat my, my, uh, my, um, my, um, my seedling, or my small plant, then I will not have a, a tree. So a theory of change is an explanation of how things, of how a project team feels things will roll out to, in order to create a particular change. So a theory of change is a comprehensive description and has to have an illustration. It has to be illustrated in terms of a diagram, yeah? And then it must tell us how a change will happen and why that change will happen. And that change will happen in what context? Like it has to be very specific, yeah? Just tell us how a change will happen, why that change will happen, and what context that change will happen. But remember what you talked about, a theory. You talked about theory being confirmed through research. So you have to have a theory in a theory of change that supports your change process or proposed change process. So re remember without a theory, then there's no theory of change, yeah? And, and I'm going to, I'm focusing a lot on theory because um, um, from practice, faulty theories um, have caused programs to fail. And, um, and, um, and, and a good example is what you can see here, yeah? A faulty theory, for example, people, people are arguing that, um, access to a resource will lead to use of that resource. For example, um, we are saying that, um, that um, a community, um, I don't know what example to give, like, um, like children are facing uh, um, uh, challenges in terms of accessing the education because they cannot, because their school is very far from, from their homes. And therefore we are providing them with a bicycle. So you expect that now because these kids have a bicycle, they have access to that resource, that they're going to use that resource, they're going to use that bicycle to go to school. But that is not really the case. And that is what uh, most projects have demonstrated. You, people, you, can, you can think people don't have water or um, the water source is very far from them. And then you think that you building them either a dam or a borehole will have them use that resource. Or you think, for example, that um, um, you may also think that uh, uh, people do not have uh, energy sources or, or electricity, and then you provide solar to them. And then you, you, uh, your, your, your theory is because they have access to the resource, they're going to use it, but that is not true. Um, you've seen communities that have even uh, vandalized um, um, water sources and things like that because that was not what they wanted or not their priority or they were not even consulted, yeah? The other faulty theory is that because you have knowledge, automatically you'll change your behavior. Again, that is not true. You can have the knowledge, but unless your attitude um, uh, and acceptance to that knowledge, uh, you have acceptance and, uh, of attitude to that, or positive attitude to that knowledge, um, then we are going to see practice or behavior change. But just, because someone has knowledge doesn't mean their behavior will change, yeah? 
the same thing that when you send a message, it is equal to communication. That is not true. You can send a message, but you've not communicated. Um, the same thing that because uh, um, there is ownership, people are going to be responsible for that thing. That is also not true. So these are some examples of faulty theories that um, projects are usually used and has led to their failure. So in your theory of change, you have to ensure that your theory is well backed up by evidence so that whatever change you're trying to initiate or institute as a result of that project is actually achieved. So um, uh, um, the next few slides, we look at um, how you develop a theory of change. Um, first, it has to be a rigorous process. And rigor here means like well thought, um, you've used multiple data sources, uh, a source of information, and you've talked to different experts, that is rigorous. Participatory, ensure it is involving everybody. That theory is involving everybody who, is, who has a keen interest in the project. And then um, um, you identify the stakeholders. Once you identify the stakeholders, you identify the conditions that um, um, are required for that change to unfold. And then you identify also what you want to achieve, like what is exactly you want to achieve, what is the long-term goal that the project wants to achieve. And then once you've done that, now you start building your way back. It's called backward mapping, yeah? So from now, the goal that you want to achieve, what outcomes are required for us to achieve that goal? Um, how, what um, uh, um, outputs are required? And then uh, for a theory of change different to, um, a slightly different to a, lo a, a log frame, it has to be mapped out. Like these particular outputs will lead to this particular um, outcome. And this particular output can also lead to that particular outcome. And you'll uh, you see like the arrows, this one can lead to this one and things like that. Um, I'm, I'm going to show you um, a graphic representation, yeah? Um, so this, 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 for example, now is, is, a, is a, a, a very good theory of change, yeah? You can see how the arrows, um, um, for example, you can, you can tell this one is maybe the, uh, the input, for example, funding, and then this funding, We'll, we have this activity, activity one or output one, output two, output three. And then you can see this particular, for example, this output will lead to this outcome, but also this output will lead to this outcome. So you can see like, um, we call it a messy process. Yeah, It is creating a, a, a coming up with a theory of change is a messy process because development itself is messy. And, and, um, and I think uh, J, uh, Jenny talked about in the morning when she said, like they realized like, at any one point, one project cannot overcome poverty. You cannot deal with poverty form. You can contribute to eradication of poverty, but no one project can overcome poverty because poverty is contributed by multiple factors. And I think a theory of change um, appreciates that, that development is, um, is not linear, it's multidimensional, and there are very many pathways to development. So um, this is a good example of, of um, of um, a, a, a theory of change and how you, you, can, you can see the facilitator. So most likely there is a group of stakeholders behind him and then they're they are helping, um, come, helping come up with um, the cost of pathways. These arrows are what you're calling the cost of pathways. Like this one is caused by this. This one will lead to this and, and, and etc, etc. Yeah, so um, when coming up to the theory of change, you have to systematically think about the uh, root causes of development challenges and how they influence each other, how these, um, for example, if it is poverty, if um, if um, uh, if um, uh, like for example the vicious cycle of poverty, like um, if 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 a girl is not educated, then most likely she will um, she will get um, uh, um, married off at an early age um, and become a mother at a very early age, and uh, because of that, then uh, because they were not educated, um, uh, their their child again because their child not be educated again, like. All these influences, the education influence, the how education influences um, early marriages, how uh, um, uh, maybe at a poor nutrition influences um, poor, uh, lack of education and things like that. Like how uh, um, there are so many things that influence each other for you, um, uh, uh, for 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 development, for different development challenges to to happen, and then um, you provide uh, you provide that. A framework for learning, and I think that's the, um, a key, a key, um, 
a key goal of um, a theory of change. Yeah? A theory of change can teach you a lot. Um, and the theory of change has also been, uh, the proponents have said that theory of change is a live document, yeah? So that in case you realize that this output did not lead to this outcome, you can have a sit down again with the team and then say, what went wrong? What did not hold? What assumptions did not hold? What context did not hold? Why are we not getting what we wanted? And things like that. So it can be a very good way for learning for different projects. So um, I've talked about this, you identify uh, um, the long-term goal, you do backward mapping, come up with your basic assumptions and context. And always um, um, that number three is important uh, for me to mention because you're also supposed to monitor um, your assumptions uh, regularly, like monitor, are my assumptions still holding? Is my context changing? And is this having, having an effect on the, uh, on the, on the, on the objectives or the goals that uh, we, we are intending to achieve? And then you identify the interventions that you're going to put in place to achieve that um, change. And then you uh, develop indicators. And then now you come up with your narrative. A theory of change must have a narrative. Like if, if this and this happens and these and these are constant, then this will happen. Do you know you're doing a narrative based on, on all these things that you've come up with? So um, a theory of change is read downwards um, uh, in terms of um, what stakeholders are we trying to help? What are their needs? And I'm um, saying again, emphasizing what uh, Jenny said, involvement of the beneficiaries and the key stakeholders. Um, what do they need? And then what is the long-term change that you want to achieve? And then now you come down to your outcomes. What outcomes will lead to that change? What outputs will lead to that out outcome? And then what activities are required um, to reach that output? And then what are the preconditions or the context or the assumptions that we are running the project for? Um, but then um, once, this is now when developing the theory, yeah? But when now you put it on paper and you're given it for to read, they will read it starting with, this was the need of the stakeholders. These are the preconditions that are there. Because of that, now these are the activities that we came up with to come up with these outputs to lead to these outcomes and eventually to these long-term change. So you, uh, you read it, the way you read it and the way you write it is a direct opposite. You start from what are the needs, what activities do you require, and then all these things. Once you now um, put it on paper, it is read the other way around. Like, well, these are the needs of the stakeholders, yes. These are the preconditions that existed, yes. Therefore, these are the activities we came up with to come up with these and then come up eventually with these long-term change. Um, um, these are the common challenges and how you can uh, overcome these challenges when developing a, a, a theory of change. The first one is um, lack of stakeholder involvement um, and then um, limited data availability when you do not have um, data, um, data to inform you the, uh, um, uh, an understanding of the challenges that you're going through and even the theory as we talked about. And then um, also very important is um, the complexity of the causal pathways. You said like one, one activity can contribute, one output can contribute to different outcomes and vice versa. So um, that, that complexity of the pathways of change and you talked about development being um, challenges development being very complex. So how um, just trying to um, identify the causal pathways can also be very challenging. And then how do you overcome this? The first thing is um, you engage stakeholders, you make sure you've collected relevant data, you make sure you've involved experts, especially M&D experts in developing your theory of change to help you think through it. And then um, you review and refine your theory regularly. Uh, at any intervals, um, regularly you can sit down with your team and then see uh, is our theory still, uh, our theory of change, does it still hold? What can we um, uh, alter or improve or things like that? And then a few examples of theory of change. These are um, a few examples. Um, you can see here, um, well, we are talking about um, the stakeholders. Yeah? You have the university students, particularly male and female students who are 25 years old um, and they drink um and they drink at least two cups of coffee per day yeah so um as as, as um uh, as uh, i'm actually doing it wrong for assuming we've just gotten this theory of change yeah the first thing you are you are supposed to look at is the outcome or impact what are we trying to achieve the impact yeah we want at least eight hours 
of sleep every night for students. We want them to sleep at least eight hours. Therefore, they have much better concentration, much better mood, and higher grades. So they actually the impact here, we want improved performance for these students, yeah? And then improved performance will be achieved by these things. When they sleep, that is now the theory. Like uh, when they sleep eight hours a night, then they will have much better concentration, they'll have much better mood. But then um, for, for them to achieve at least eight hours of sleep, what, what will lead to that? They will have to uh, reduce coffee drinking by at least 60%. So again, I, there's another part of this theory that says uh, students are not drinking, uh, so students are not um, sleeping enough because they're taking a lot of coffee, yeah? And then now, um, because they're taking a lot of coffee, they're sleeping uh, less than eight hours and therefore their productivity and things like that. So you, I can, I'm going to share this with you and you can also have a look at um, some of these examples of theory of change and you can see different depictions, but at the end of the day is an illustration. It has to be an illustrated, like you think your thought process, um, your context, your assumptions and things like that, yeah? This is another one for a different project and you can look at the, there are preconditions down here and then um, how the inputs are leading to activities, to outputs, to outcomes, and then the stakeholders that are involved and then their needs. So again, very easy to interpret. Um, and this is also, uh, also another theory of change for another project. You can see here, you can see now the ad was here, the, uh, the inputs, uh, the inputs that are required with these assumptions holding, and these also these assumption holding, then you can achieve this activity. And this activity will lead to um, the assumption that the family planning trainings are successful. If they are successful, then um, the output one, two will be achieved. Once output one, two will be achieved, then you will achieve outcome one and two, which will lead to improved sexual health in the community. So just, um, I think this was my last slide, yeah. Um, I hope I haven't overwhelmed you. I, I, I'm hoping we're going to get more forums to talk about this, that um, the knowledge, uh, we get a, a, a good depth of the knowledge. Yeah, so um, we can take a few questions maybe for five minutes or so. I'll read for you. Yes, please. So, um, from where we stopped, we have Lorna asking, remember you, someone asked about process indicators, activity indicators. So Lorna asks, does this mean we can do a process evaluation? For example, when you collect data using COBO, what is your means of verification in this case? Okay, um, I think those are, different. so the first one is, can we do process evaluation? Can we do process evaluation? Okay. Um, then she has an example. For example, when you collect data using COBO, what is your means of verification in this case? Okay, um, I think uh, I will let um, other experts answer the question of process evaluation, but mm -hmm. uh, let me answer the one on COBO. Um, when you collect uh, data using COBO, what is your means of verification? That's what she's asking. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the means of verification in this case, um, remember COBO is just a, 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 a software you're using to collect your data. And COBO, the good thing about COBO, you can collect data that is qualitative or quantitative. So depending on, uh, on, um, on that source, for example, if you're, you're collecting qualitative data that you have to talk to people and get their sentiments, um, uh, narratives, uh, sentiment in terms of narratives, then your means of verification for that is interviews. You're, 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 um, either, it can be either semi-structured interviews with the community members, that is your means of verification. Now, because that is your means of verification, how do you, how are you going to achieve the semi-structured interviews with, with the community members? Now you come up with a semi-structured questionnaire that you input in COBO 
then your either yourself or or your research assistant they go to the field and collect the data from the community members so the means of verification here is the interviews the semi structured interviews and then you're just using kobo uh, to collect your data and um, and uh, to collect your data in the field and then to come and do an, your analysis so i think i hope that's clear okay uh -huh. from where i'm sitting yes and i hope it is for lona then we have vincent um other log frames would have both assumptions and risks what would be the difference or importance yeah um so assumptions assumptions would be um actually most log frames usually have its stroke Sometimes an assumption can be a risk, but not always. Let me show you um, an example. Um, let me just, uh, just a moment. Let me show you a log frame I developed uh, recently that has different assumptions from risks. Just a moment, please. Yeah, uh, let me zoom in so that. Uh... Okay, so this one, um, the impact, I don't know whether I've zoomed in enough. Um, the impact for this particular project was improved safety in pregnancy. And 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 uh, and uh, enhanced quality of specialized healthcare for pregnant adolescent girls and newborns in Narok County. Um, the indicator is the percentage reduction in maternal and neonatal complications among pregnant adolescent girls in Narok County. So the means of verification now we will know that we've reduced uh, maternal and neonatal complications will be the medical records or health facility records or even um, the Kenya Demographic Health Survey. Now let us look at the assumptions here and risks. Yeah. So the assumption here is that there is availability of trained providers who can deliver specialized care. That is not a risk, it's an assumption that they are, the, the healthcare providers will be available, the ones that have been trained. And then um, um, the second assumption is that there is, there is adequate funding and resources. So this one can be a risk, but you have to word it differently for it to be a risk. You can say limited, um, or inadequate funding and resources. But the assumption is that there is a risk, sorry, there is adequate resources and funding. And then finally, that the uh, legislative and policy framework or environment in the country, in the county, is going to be um, uh, conducive for you to implement your, um, for you to implement your, um, uh, your project. Now, the risks are now limited availability of trained healthcare providers, that's a risk. If there is limited availability, if there is insufficient funding or resources, then that is also a risk. If the social, social, social cultural norms or the, um, um, the culture around the community um, uh, 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 hinders the provision of, uh, of um, quality health services, the adolescent health, health services, that can also have an, an adverse effect on the project. So that's also a risk. So um, I don't know whether that is clear. Like assumptions are, and risks are related, but they are worded differently. If you decide your wording assumptions, you can't word them as risks, and you can't word risk as assumption. But both of them are very important in the in in this particular log frame because if these ones hold, actually, when when a project fails, one of the things that um, an audit, uh, an M and D audit, would look at. Mm -hmm. The assumptions that we came up with and the risk, did they hold? What did they, um, or even, even uh, were there any additional assumptions and risks that we, uh, we, we had an oversight on or we did not see? So I hope that's clear uh, with so many words. Okay. And Vincent continues yes. to ask Is a TOC mandatory? to have for a thriving projects implementation 
and every evaluation process? Yeah, um, as I said, it depends with donors sometimes and sometimes with um, project, uh, the project management of the project. Some would choose a TOC, some would choose a, lo a log frame, um, some even would choose both. But a log frame is very important in my opinion um, because even it helps even in terms of even evaluation. And um, it's a whole again topic, talk about how you use a, a, a TOC um, to do your evaluation. Okay, Alexander Opicho has two questions. One is a request. Um, kindly sir, repeat to explain outcome harvesting. Then the question, there is a software called TalkSoft for working on the theory of change. Are we able to learn about it? Okay, um, um, outcome harvesting is a whole approach on its own. Um, um, but what it does, um, away from the predetermined outcomes in the log frame or in the theory of change, um, periodically in the implementation of a project, um, the M&D people come to the project, interact with the beneficiaries, and try to harvest outcomes. Like what are, are there any significant changes, for example, in behavior um, that they are experiencing or we can experience through an interaction with them. And then we come up now, we are, it's like we are, we are harvesting outcomes, like any changes, any significant changes or in, uh, even in behavior, both intended and non-intended that are actually coming up as a result of this project. Um, and then we, we, we go back with these outcomes that we've harvested. Um, there's a whole, uh, um, science behind it and, uh, and a protocol behind it about how you go through the whole process. Um, and then you come back with your project team and then you say, these are the outcomes you've harvested. Um, what are they telling us? Um, so it's, it's a whole approach. Um, and I think uh, I told you Mandi is very dynamic. There's usually very, very, very many approaches coming up uh, now and again, um, but it's something we can also set aside some time to, to take you through. Um, about the software, I think, again, there are very many softwares uh, to help uh, monitoring and evaluation, coming up with these tools and so on. Um, I think in terms of whether you can be trained, I think I'll, 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 like, I'll again throw it to the training director. Okay. Um, next, uh, are we done? We have two more. So okay. one, Francis Ouma. In many behavior change communication programs, Many people or organizations focus on sensitizing the community on particular knowledge, assuming that by getting the knowledge, the people will change their behavior. The question, can we say this has been a false theory of change and more needs to be done? Sure, sure. I think um, I totally agree with that. Okay. Then we have uh, Matteo. Can you please highlight the importance of possibly setting a control group whenever we are tracking indicators? Um, it is not uh, mandatory to have a control group. It will depend on the kind of evaluation um, method that you, you've um, you decided to employ. A control group is usually used in um, in in in, um, in um, either quasi experimental uh, designs. Um, I, I can't remember another one, uh, but it is not necessary. It's not important. No, okay, not that it's not important. It's important, yes, but uh, um, uh, having a control group um, or not having a control group does not mean that the project. Um, is not doing the right things. Mm -hmm. Having a control group is essential if the impact evaluation that you've um, selected uh, uh, requires you to have that control group. So what you're saying, um, it would be um, uh, each project will determine whether a control group will bring more efficiency and effectiveness? 
I, 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 at the time of designing a project, if you're doing a good design, you need to have the evaluation in mind, like how will we evaluate this project? Um, and again, there are different types of evaluation, um, um, either at midterm, at end term, at impact level, and things like that. Now, for, for whatever evaluation method you choose, there's a, there's a whole uh, um, uh, science behind it. For example, if you choose um, uh, to do an impact evaluation, there are different methods of even doing an impact evaluation, like the one I've, mm -hmm. I've, like the one I've said, quasi experimental. So if, if, if in that particular uh, methodology of you've set aside to, to choose or you've chosen to evaluate your project requires you to have a control group, right from mm -hmm. the beginning of the project, you, have, you need to identify that control group and, and, also, um, uh, and also consider factors such as the spillover effect and things like that. Okay. Yeah. Then uh, Milka, is, it's a comment. Milka says, um, just to comment, in some schools of thought, they say we start with the theory of change, then we build a result framework from it, then we finally design a log frame, that is a four by four matrix. And the whole process is called designing a logical model. So that is just a comment from her. And um, I see no more questions. So for you, Job, I would say you, you directed us to get an answer on um, process evaluation. And then you also guided this uh, slide you will share on which matter, let me see. Yeah, um, on uh, quality of a good indicator. Yes. Correct. Okay. No, 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 no. I think uh, data quality, data quality. Um, yeah, data quality assurance. Yeah. yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. All right. So that is it, Job. And there are no more questions. Thank you a lot um, for having me and uh, for being good listeners. I hope um, there's something you took home today. Back Thank to you very much. Um, yeah. Mark, you can take over. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, John. You can hear me? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for participating in this uh, second session that we are having. I want just to let you know that we have a third session coming up uh, at uh, the top of the hour. But before we do that, we'll take another 10 minute break and then we'll, we'll come back. I just want to let you know that um, I also saw the hands of uh, Jenny, one of our faculty members. I don't know if your issue was uh, resolved, Jenny. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mark. And actually, I wanted to contribute to the conversation that uh, Job was having in responding to the question about whether we need to do have indicators, whether we need to have a control group. And for, for people who are not, you know, you're not evaluation experts, and that's not where you're heading. As Job says, this, some of this um, but some of these things in m &E are really technical. However, one of the easiest way to describe and explain what a control group is, when you're doing an impact evaluation, and in this case, we are defining an impact evaluation as the, the evaluation which, which is measuring attribution. Attribution, which means what? The change we are seeing in this community is absolutely attributed to our project. So when you want to measure that, like the example I had given, you can go to a community, do the right things, but not get the results you want. So now we want to measure the reduction in poverty in this community is only because of our project. So you have to do an impact evaluation. To do that impact evaluation, therefore means you must have a control group. A control group is a group that is similar in all aspects to the community in which we, are, we have the intervention, but will not receive the intervention. That is what a control group is, and it is used in the evaluations that Job mentioned, and particularly when you're measuring impact, measuring attribution. Mm -hmm. So indicators are used all the time for any project, 
for whatever the reason is, but that is what a control group is. Thank you, Mark. Back to you. Uh, very well said, uh, Jenny. I, I think uh, the other aspects, uh, we, we actually co will collect some of this information. And I also know that some of you or our students will still be meeting in class. So we'll try to bring this information back to you uh, a little bit much better. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that uh, some of our facilitators are here so they can be able to pick up these areas and then bring it back to you to class. I would also like to make some one announcement. We, we will be giving you a certificate, <clears throat> uh, but we're going to take a 10 minute break and we'll come back. And so I hope that you registered correctly uh, with your official names so that when you print your certificate, it's not having uh, some AKA name, but uh, the name that you like to desire to have for this master's class. So we're coming up after 10 minutes, please keep time. We have Dr. Joyce Gogi coming in to speak to us about data. So please uh, take your leave. As uh, when the music stops, please come back to class. Over to you. More than 168 million people in over 50 countries are in need of humanitarian aid. Highly violent conflicts are causing widespread hunger, displacement, human suffering, death and destruction around the world. Now more than ever, there's an acute need for skilled humanitarian manpower to match the growing need. It's time to take action and grow your career in the humanitarian sector. Welcome to Strategia Netherlands. And exciting career with skills that greatly increase their prospects for employment as well as value to employers. Our students work for international organizations such as the United Nations and national and international non governmental organizations and various governments. You can now apply online for diploma and postgraduate courses with a flexible schedule that allows you to study and maintain full-time employment. Apply now for a Diploma in Monitoring and Evaluation Diploma in Conflict Management Diploma in Leadership and Management Diploma in Humanitarian Logistics Diploma in Community Development Diploma in Grant Management Diploma in Disaster Management Diploma in Water, Sanitation and Hygiene Diploma in Gender Development and Diploma in Food Security and Nutrition in Humanitarian Emergencies the cost for diploma courses is 800 euros, while postgraduate courses cost 1,200 euros. Visit www.strategianetherlands.eu for more information. Take action and register today. More than 168 million people in over 50 countries are in need of humanitarian aid. Highly violent conflicts are causing widespread hunger, displacement, human suffering, death and destruction around the world. Now more than ever, there's an acute need for skilled humanitarian manpower to match the growing need. 
it's time to take action and grow your career in the humanitarian sector. Welcome to Strategia Netherlands. We are an international organization that aims at making development and humanitarian work more effective. We are an independent and private provider of online and distance learning in humanitarian courses. Our mission is to provide our clients with relevant and high quality courses to propel them to the heights of their choice careers. With over 300 exciting career-focused courses to choose from at Strategia Netherlands, our students are imparted with skills that greatly increase their prospects for employment as well as value to employers. Our students work for international organizations such as the United Nations and national and international non-governmental organizations and various governments. You can now apply online for diploma and postgraduate courses with a flexible schedule that allows you to study and maintain full-time employment. Apply now for a Diploma in Monitoring and Evaluation Diploma in Conflict Management Diploma in Leadership and Management Diploma in Humanitarian Logistics Diploma in Community Development Diploma in Grant Management Diploma in Disaster Management Diploma in Water, Sanitation and Hygiene Diploma in Gender Development and Diploma in Food Security and Nutrition in Humanitarian Emergencies. The cost for diploma courses is 800 euros, while postgraduate courses cost 1,200 euros. Visit www.strategianetherlands.eu for more information. Take action and register today. More than 168 million people in over 50 countries are in need of humanitarian aid. Highly violent conflicts are causing widespread hunger, displacement, human suffering, death and destruction around the world. Now more than ever, there's an acute need for skilled humanitarian manpower to match the growing need. It's time to take action and grow your career in the humanitarian sector. Welcome to Strategia Netherlands. We are an international organization that aims at making development and humanitarian work more effective. We are an independent and private provider of online and distance learning in humanitarian courses. Our mission is to provide our clients with relevant and high quality courses to propel them to the heights of their choice careers. With over 300 exciting career focused courses to choose from at Strategia Netherlands, our students are imparted with skills that greatly increase their prospects for employment as well as value to employers. Our students work for international organizations such as the United Nations and national and international non-governmental organizations and various governments. You can now apply online for diploma and postgraduate courses with a flexible schedule that allows you to study and maintain full-time employment. Apply now for a Diploma in Monitoring and Evaluation Diploma in Conflict Management Diploma in Leadership and Management Diploma in Humanitarian Logistics Diploma in Community Development Diploma in Grant Management Diploma in Disaster Management Diploma in Water, Sanitation and Hygiene Diploma in Gender Development 
and diploma in food security and nutrition in humanitarian emergencies. The cost for diploma courses is 800 euros, while postgraduate courses cost 1,200 euros. Visit www.strategianetherlands.eu for more information. Take action and register today. So hello everyone, if you're back, we can take the last session. Anybody in the room to speak to me, if you're back? Good afternoon. Right, right. Uh, so Regina, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, yes, 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 you are, you are, you are audible. Yes, welcome. Great, great, great. So I, I want to repeat that we're going to provide you with a certificate for a master's, um, uh, this master class. And uh, this goes to all of you, quite a number. So we need to have your names correctly. I already, uh, somebody has told me they used a colloquial name. So <laughs> you need to send an email to, uh, the academic email so that that can be corrected if you did not register correctly, but uh, you will all receive an e-certificate. So we'll not be able to mail the certificate to you because of the costs, but you receive an e-certificate um, from Strategia so that you can be part of your portfolio as you move forward. Um, allow me to quickly confirm if Dr. Wangare, I've just been told that she's in the room, but uh, before we do that, uh, she's coming to speak to us around the data analysis. Data is very important. And uh, one of the things that uh, you probably need to understand is that uh, DQAs or data quality improvements, uh, data analysis will help us to uh, look through our projects and uh, be able to determine whether what we are seeing is exactly what's happening on the ground and for us to do that it's important for us to collect data continuously analyze it and be able to make a meaning out of data. data actually is a management tool and for those of you who are managing programs it's important for us to look at it uh, at this point this is going to be our last session and therefore it will take the same format that we have had in the last two sessions so what we're going to do is to welcome dr wangari to come in and uh, take us through this session Dr. Ongare is a PhD holder in research. She's well published, and this is an authority, uh, both in academic circles and also in the press, uh, press publications. She's actually passionate about continuous improvement, and that's why she falls within our faculty members. And uh, you can also see much of our portfolio if you log into our, uh, our website, www.wangari. Uh, Dot Africa, you can be able to see much of what she has been able to do. So this is somebody that is uh, priceless, but uh, we are very fortunate to have her today to come and speak to us. Dr. Angori, Angori if you can come in. Uh, in my in my native country, we, we have to clap if you come into the session, but this is online, so I really don't think we can clap for you. But uh, when she is done with our presentation, we will be able to look through. I know June has been very gracious today to be reading for us the comments uh, section, but we'll also allow you to you know, raise your hands and then we will be able to look through some of the issues that may come out of this presentation and then she'll be able to respond. We hope that this should take us at least an hour uh, or thereabouts. So welcome. Thank you so much, Mark Rabudi, for that uh, warm welcome. I'm seeing the energy in the room. I definitely think we can clap. So oh, let's yeah. see if we can all go to the reactions bar. Let's just check the energy in the room. You guys have had such amazing presentations. I was listening right. to those earlier. Right. Uh, okay, so let's okay. all go to the reactions bar. Everybody, let's see if we are still on Zoom. Everybody, yes, I see the claps. <laughs> A few. Uh, thumbs up. I see some flowers, the confetti. Nobody chose a love heart. Okay. Nobody chose to laugh. I see some people waving their real hands, not even virtual. This is very well done. Thank you so much, Abdi Rahmin. I 
you. <laughs> a few people are actually sending love hearts. Amazing, yes, yeah, spreading the love. Around. And even in the chat as well. Uh, I don't know how to do that, actually. How do you put a uh, emoji in the chat? Someone will have to train me on that one. I only know the one for <laughs> the reactions, but do you um, type it in the chat or how does that happen? I guess uh, somebody's laughing. I hope you're not laughing at me. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. And uh, this is good energy. This is good energy to power through the, the final presentation. And uh, we will now be rounding it up. We started off the first presentation, the second presentation, and these are all connected because now we are at the stage of analysis and reporting. So I will be talking about, ah, <laughs> you absolutely are laughing at me. I still don't know how to do that, but I will learn. Oh, I see where that is. Let me add my reaction. Now I found it. Yeah, this technology comes and goes. So easy to learn how to put reactions now in the, in the I just learned that right now, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Now, um, Edith, you can uh, uh, also praise me for learning something today. So, hey, my as, <laughs> thank you so much. So I'll be talking about uh, data analysis and reporting in monitoring and evaluation. Uh, I was just listening to uh, John earlier speaking about uh, quality of life and indicators and how we measure that. And actually, my doctorate is not in research, as, as Mark had said. I'm, I am a psychologist. I'm trained in psychology, so I am a social scientist. I also am an m and &E consultant. I am a research specialist. I do uh, research mentorship to groups of scholars online and offline, over 200,000 daily. Uh, at least with the power of the internet, we can scale up and do uh, global you know, work like what Strategia Netherlands is doing. And so I'm really honored to be here today. So um, I think he had said much more about what I've done. And my M&E experience has been mostly in the field of mental health. I was involved in the national level getting uh, indicators for what we need for our action plan, actually. Now Kenya has a a national mental health action plan, and we have indicators for what we want to see for people's well being, which is just really amazing. I also got a global award at the APA for my doctorate study, which was about people who use sign language, people who are deaf and hard of hearing. And um, now I do quite lots of trainings, not just in uh, M and E, but also research, data analysis, scientific writing, psychology, disability studies, and so on and so forth. So you can check out wangari.africa for more details. So we'll be doing two things. Our mandate is on analysis and reporting. So we'll provide an overview of analysis and interpretation. And let's also look at the various types of data analysis and how do you actually select appropriate statistics? Usually, how you select your statistics depends on how you design your uh, M and E project and which kinds of data you want to collect and analyze. And then we will look at reporting and we'll go into the nitty gritty on the tips of uh, what is involved, why is it important, how exactly to write a report. Uh, typically, most people will complain if you are the project manager and you've written a report badly. So it's good to know which sections need to be essentially included and uh, also best practices on when to do this reporting and who are the people who are in charge of uh, different sections of report writing for resource-based projects. So those are the different topics uh, also we will uh, go over. So I ask your kind attention so that we power through uh, these slides together. So there is a very famous story on the crow and the picture. This is an old fable. You probably heard about it, but there was a very hot day and this crow, this uh, bird actually was very thirsty and found a pitcher at the side of the tree. You can see the lovely picture there with some drawing there at the corner of the slide. And obviously the crow could not reach the water at the bottom of the pitcher. So what did it do? It took up some pebbles and poured it in the pitcher in order for the water level to rise. Now, a lot of scientists have studied that phenomenon. And, you know, in my field of psychology, 
people will say, oh, maybe that was just reflex action or instrument, we call it instrumental conditioning. But now we have established that, no, actually it was goal-directed behavior that had to do with monitoring the level of water in order to fulfill a certain objective. So obviously in M and E, we talk about things like uh, objective, activity, inputs, outputs, outcomes, indicators. And so what would we say was the major goal or objective of the crow? It was to eliminate thirst. That's pretty clear to everybody. So then what was the activity that the crow engaged in? It started dropping pebbles in the water one by one and monitoring the level of the water. So the inputs were probably the pebbles, the crow, the pitcher, and some of you might want to add a few inputs like the stone on which you can see the crow is uh, standing on. If you can think of any other inputs, uh, let me know. Uh, then the output was that the water level actually rose. Okay. And what would you say the outcomes were? There was a short term, medium term, and a long term. So you can say short term or medium term, the, the crow was able to drink water. And long term, the crow was satisfied and had, you know, um, no problems like fast anymore. And what are the indicators? Uh, we had the number of pebbles drop. And how do you know that? By counting, quite literally, because uh, it would uh, drop the pebble and see, check, you know. So those are some of the indicators to know that actually the water level rose. How about the indicator of the water actually rising? It, that would be observation. That would be just, it's using its eyes to check the water. And um, hopefully the pitcher was in a flat place so that, you know, the water was able to, to rise or if it was in a tilted or sloping uh, ground, then maybe the water rose faster, I don't know. And the indicator that it was satisfied, it's the crow's level of dust. Um, a few more people, you know, might think of other outcomes like, you know, its own creativity level also increasing and others that are more, you know, um, qualitative than quantitative. Um, so what therefore is data and why is it important? When we talk about the field of statistics, it is a vital tool. It provides organizations necessary information to make decisions. We know that statistics started in 17th century Europe. However, we know we have the earliest evidence of mathematical manipulations from Sub-Saharan Africa. We have the black civilization in Egypt, the very famous pyramids um, that had to have mathematical computations done for those huge towering pyramids to be built. And all across Sub-Saharan Africa, even the more less, uh, the less famous ones. But now we talk about two main branches in the formal body called statistics, descriptive and inferential. I don't know if you remember those from statistics class from way back when. <laughs> <laughs> or they could have been high school the first time you heard about it, or it could be just now, um, maybe after high school in college. So descriptive statistics focus on the summary or display of data so that we can quickly obtain an overview. Inferential statistics are those that allow us to infer. To infer means that you can make a conclusion about a population based on a sample. All right. So the idea of inferring, and in that case, we call those parameters not statistics when we talk about inferential statistics. So all of us are consumers of data. We need to be aware of misuses of data. Do you recall, um, or do you usually, whenever you go to buy something from the shop, do you check the label and check the percentages written on the composition or on ingredients of maybe it's food or something? Do you ever do that? I'm not sure if. All of us are that conscientious or detail oriented, but you know, being detail oriented is something useful when you do analysis. But you may also remember during COVID time, we had lots of statistics driving full economies from the health sector. We had quite a number of people, uh, you know, dying of COVID, and we had daily statistics from governments. And those statistics helped us to know where we are supposed to be. Uh, if we are supposed to leave the house during, there was a time there was global lockdown and we all remember being consumers of data. So whether we like it or not, there is big data. There's also all kinds of other statistics going on around us. So it's quite important for us to have a head of at least what's going on in the statistical world. There are a few lucrative courses in the 21st century too. Is any of us in any of these fields 
data scientists, data architects, data engineer, data analysts. Do we have any AI engineers, BI analysts, um, machine learning engineers, NLP engineers? Do we have any statisticians? Just type in the chat, just checking if we are all present. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Uh, do we have anyone in this uh, or, ah, I see. Someone, Edith Nyangoma says BMI and AI, small, small. Okay, got that. Remember we are all on this huge learning curve. AI has come and we now talk about industrial disruption. We are now in the uh, age of tech and tech is definitely creating disruption in the good sense of doing good work. And we also have to think about all the ethics that come along. I see only her. I don't know if there's anybody else. I'm just checking the chat. Is there anybody else in this field? Okay, looks like we are all getting there. So uh, how to become a data scientist? You have to master a few core skills and statistics is what today we will be mostly unpacking, but there are also program skills, which is why you know this is also under M and E, basic right. mathematics, data knowledge, machine learning, data visualization. Those are some things we get to appreciate people who crunch the numbers because they get to really give us uh, clue on um, trends, patterns, distribution of data that drives decision-making for organizations, for individuals, for governments, for global institutions and things like that. So I see someone else saying, Jomina Richardson, BI and BA and trained in statistics, PhD in applied econometrics. Okay, that's good to know. Really amazing to know that we do have some people here doing data as their main career. So when we are talking about data analysis, you are home with this presentation. So what is data? What is information? And what is statistics? Just type in the chat if you can do that. Um, just because of the interest of time, we will not take any um, hands, but I just want to take some sharing in the chat. What is data? How is it different from information? And what is statistics? If you want, you can uh, consult Google. So I'll just give you a minute so that you can type that. Any takers, just try. We are here to learn. <laughs> you know, we say in adult learning, there's no right or wrong answer. We can always improve from any point where we are and go to a better place, right? So what is data? What is information? What is statistics? Just type in the chat. Okay, I see some answers already measuring results. So which one is that? Out of the three, which one is about measuring results? All of them or one of them? Okay, I can't pronounce your name. Shego Fatso Kosida Dialwa. Data and information means the same. Statistics is specific to numerical. No, no, no. Really interesting. Lona Maru says statistics is analysis of the data. Edith says quantities and characters is data. Okay, very interesting. Okay, Milka Kalinda says data is unprocessed information. Karina Van Hoek says data is quantitative or qualitative information. Really interesting, yeah. Uh, you're all right. I haven't seen any answer that's off actually. <laughs> so I think we are all moving well together. Data is the value that's assigned to a specific observation or measurement. And obviously there are many other definitions, including the ones you have already mentioned. How is data different from information? Data can also be defined as raw facts and figures that pertain to a measurement of interest. However, information is what is derived from the raw facts and figures, okay? So information is processed data that is used for the purpose of making decisions. So you get raw facts and figures, which is the data, then you process it, you get information. So if you had like a bunch of values that were maybe salaries of uh, let's say all the people on this Zoom room, and then those would be random numbers and nobody would make sense of 65 
or so different figures. However, if we arrange them into a histogram or a bar graph, then we can take one representative value like a mean score, an average, and say this is the average salary of all the people in this Zoom room. So that is now information. It is useful, it's valuable. We can say that that information uh, is processed data. So data is the building block of all statistics. We use statistics to, inf to transform data into information. What are the sources of data, primary and secondary? Most definitely we know that primary data is the one we get from field work. Secondary data, we might be able to find it in media reports, desk reviews, and things like that. So a lot of times in M and E, we are going out to collect fresh data, primary data. So what kinds of data and types do we have? We have qualitative and quantitative. And somebody alluded to that very well, actually. Uh, somebody said quantitative or qualitative. Yes, that was Karina. And I see more and more uh, explanations. Yes, keep them coming. Ondasa Bekena says data is raw facts like one, but information is processed data, which has meaning. Yes. Seedwell says data is raw facts, information is processed raw facts. Okay, <laughs> it's interesting, processed raw facts. Okay, Jamina Richardson says information is piecemeal knowledge, data is feature evaluation, often numerical, but not only numerical. Statistics is a mathematical processing of data. Good, well said. Francis Onek says data is raw information, However, information is the organized data for a purpose. And statistics is analysis of all this information. Yeah. OK, good. Or we can say statistics is analysis of data to get information. So obviously, data analysis does not begin at the end. A lot of students, especially research students that I teach, m and students think that, oh, you know, you only need to like collect data, then at the end you do analysis. But the truth is you have to start analyzing from the beginning because when you're designing your M and E project, you first have to define why you need data analysis before even data collection. That's step one. Then number two, you begin data collection. Then number three, you do the cleaning or cleansing of data. Then number four, you begin manipulation or analyzing the data where now you're transforming it like the example I gave earlier on salaries. And then the last one is now interpretation, modeling. Then now you are able to discover useful information. You can make conclusions and you can support decision making. Oh, this is wonderful. More and more definitions in the chat. Yeah, keep them coming. I'll, we'll be able to read them as we go along. So we do have two types of data or variables. Quantitative is all about numbers. I'm sure you know this. This is just a refresher, just a recap. So remember, variable just means something that varies, to vary, like to change. So any phenomenon with a difference in magnitudes. So some examples of quantitative data, weight, height, BMI, that's the body mass index, your age, age at first marriage, uh, if any, okay. <laughs> Qualitative data is things like why or how, for example. What's the reason for not using a certain contraceptive method. The answer will be qualitative. It will be an explanation, it's not a number. Today's presentation will be heavily focused on quantitative kinds of data and its analysis. So as you can see from this table, we have all these different ways we can categorize quantitative and qualitative data. So I'll start from the qualitative data that's non-numerical. You can have nominal data, like just naming, variables, for example, hair color. I'm pretty sure even if a lot of you, your videos are off and that's okay. I know we all have different hair colors. And so we can kind of say all the people with pitch black hair is number one, all right? And if you ask ladies when they go to buy artificial hair from the, from the shops, they do ask for the numbers because hair colors can be Categorized like that. That's just a naming variable, like number one for pitch black, number two for brown hair, and we go getting lighter like that. Then we have another scale called ordinal. It's just a way of categorizing um, <clears throat> data. And this could be used for qualitative data or also quantitative data, both nominal and ordinal. So in ordinal, we can now begin to put an order. For example, how happy are you today? It's almost the weekend. So we can measure the level of happiness that you have. One is happy, two is neutral, three is unhappy, or vice versa. You know, we can have three, the highest number be the happiest number. 
just for the sake of you know easier data collection. Then we can talk about discrete, <clears throat> where you have data that is whole numbers, they're not broken down, like the number of items, for example. Continuous data is broken down, like height. You can get it in meters and then centimeters and millimeters and all that. So then we have interval and ratio. Uh, that's usually typically quantitative because this is about data where there are numbers with known differences, like time. Okay, so you can actually calculate um, the type, the difference. And then ratio, you have measurable interview intervals and the difference can be determined like height or weight. And we'll see a few more features of each of these data types. So now we are going to go deeper into, you know, each of these later on. So obviously the purpose of data analysis is to provide answers to research questions. And when we are doing M and E, we have a specific goal uh, in the project that we would like to know. And so we look at things like, how is the data distributed, the different patterns, the variance, the differences in the data, relationships among variables and so on. That helps us to make it meaningful, to see the salient features and to understand the distribution. Sometimes we can also be able to explain a phenomenon by just looking at data trends, okay? So what are the uses of measurement? You know, the way variables are measured is very important. And when we say measurement, we mean assigning a number to a variable. So the purpose is to give the size or extent or, or magnitude. And measurement determines the choice of relevant statistical methods. So we are going to go deeper into how to measure and the different skills in order to see how to select the best statistical method for data. So when we provide a value for magnitude or size or extent, that is actually measurement. And that gives us a basis for comparison. So have you ever seen these words before? Nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio? These are the scales of measurement. You probably had them the first time in high school. I'm not sure if you did that in high school, but they are attributed to a psychologist. I needed to mention that because I'm also a psychologist. So in 1946, Stanley Smith Stevens is the person who invented the best known classification of measurement with four levels of skills. And now we are going to unpack each one of them in turn, one by one. So you can see from the lowest skill, it's just about naming. We talked about naming different people's hair color and it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean the people with uh, number one black hair are half as much as the people with number two brown hair. It's just a name, it's just a label that you put up. I don't know if in high school or in college, you ever received a registration number or a matriculation number or an index number that was nominal. Then there's ordinal skill, that's the next level. As you can see from this diagram, for each of the levels, there is an additional attribute and we will go one by one to check what the additional attribute is in the uh, subsequent slide. So aside from naming at the ordinal level, we also talk about ordering. So the word ordinal is about putting them in order, lining them up, okay? So we can talk about levels of happiness. So if you're uh, thinking about the weekend already, maybe your level of happiness is the highest, okay? <laughs> it's just an example. Then. In interval skill, we include the naming, the ordering, and we add another attribute, the idea of proportionate interval between variables. That's really important because then we can measure differences because we know between two and three is the same as between six and seven, okay? The idea of the intervals being proportionate or the same. Then in ratio scale, we can name, we can order, we have proportionate intervals and we can accommodate an absolute zero. That makes it possible for us to do any computation. We can do division, multiplication, addition, subtraction at ratio scale because it's got all these features of all the other scales and the absolute zero. So for example, we know that temperature is a ratio scale. You can have negative temperature and that's actually a value. All right. So, as I said earlier, we'll go into each one of them. In nominal scale, we only need to classify. So pay attention to each of these attributes because we will do a little exercise uh, to see what scale uh, is which kinds of you know measurement um, 
at the end of this explanation. Then in nominal skills, we have members of a category having at least one common characteristic. So they are grouped together, but we cannot quantify or rank order those categories. So when we talk about hair colors, there's no order, it's just names of different colors. And for identification purpose, you put a number to represent the nominal variable. And the value has no numeric meaning in the way you usually think about numbers. So if we thought about all the genders represented here, we can say male, female, and other. So it doesn't mean male, if we assign it number one, it is better than female, number two, it's just a number, all right? So ordinal scale, uh, as we said earlier, we are rank ordering in the degree in which it possesses a characteristic. So the interval between ranks are not necessarily equal. People with a higher scale value have more of some attributes, okay? And the ordinal scale is the second level of measurement. Have you ever done like a Likert scale and then you're trying to fill in the responses and then you thought, okay, I'm not two or three, I'm 2.5. Has any of you ever had that experience? Like you really don't wanna select either number two or number three, maybe the scale was zero to four and two and three are in the middle. And then you go like, mm, you know, so the idea that it may not be equal uh, equal values. Yes, yes, yes. I can see a lot of you do lots of different research. I, I hope you both answer research, um, other people's research as participants, and you also, you know, disseminate your own, you know, M and E kind of things. So that is odd, you know. It uh, you may not have proportional intervals between different values. However, in interval scale, now we have to have equal um, differences between each value. So it, that allows us to not only rank order, but compare the different sizes. So we know because every attribute being measured in the next attribute, there is an equal um, space or interval. We know like, for instance, the difference between six and seven is the difference between 51 and 52. So that is interval scale. Then ratio scale, we say it has all the properties of the earlier scales as we saw earlier, then it has a true zero point and the ratio of any two numbers is meaningful. The starting point does not depend on the units of measurement. It can even go to negative. You know. So here's the little exercise we are going to do. Please number your responses, okay? So there are five questions here. I'd like you to tell me which scale is represented for each of the variables below. So we do have the first one, marital status of women. Is that a nominal scale? Is it an ordinal scale, an interval scale, or a ratio scale? You can write all the answers, number one to five, or you can write the one you think you know the answer to. <laughs> so this is called strengths-based learning. You write the one where you know you'll shine. So just write your answer. Number two, identification number of study participant. Are we talking about a uh, nominal scale here? Just type in the chat, please. Are we talking about an uh, ordinal scale when we talk about ID numbers? Is this a uh, interval scale or a ratio scale? Number two. Number three, class size. When you talk about class size, what scale is that? What scale of measurement is that? Okay, number four. Length of infants at an ANC clinic. So, you know, when babies are born at the antenatal clinic, the nurse actually measures the length of the baby. <laughs> if you didn't know that, now you know. So if we were measuring the length or height of somebody, is that actually a nominal scale, ordinal, or an interval? Or... Then lastly, a metric number, which is an index number or a registration number. Kind of scale is that? So please indicate which different, um, you know, uh, scales for which number. Please don't write an answer without a number because I don't know which one you're answering. I'm seeing some people just writing one without saying which number they're answering. So that is a problem because I wouldn't know which one. So, okay. So I see for question one, we seem to have an agreement except one person didn't uh follow the flow <laughs> and that's very interesting if we had more time i would have asked you why the reason why um 
you can always change your mind. There is still time. So most of us are saying for number one, nominal, nominal scale, okay? And uh, by virtue of democracy, which is the rule of the majority or the tyranny of the majority over the minority. <laughs> number one, marital status of women. Uh, is that nominal or ordinal scale? You only have to ask yourself, are those who are married or not married more than the others? So is that a rank order or is that just a classification? Okay, so I'm now seeing more people saying number one is, yeah, nominal, okay. And then uh, number two, a lot of you said nominal, a couple of you said ordinal, and now we have almost a tie, uh, but maybe more nominals, uh, maybe, Maybe we should also dis explain why would you think it is um, ordinal scale for those who say ordinal. So remember, we said if you're just trying to label something, then there is no rank order. So that would be nominal. Number two would be nominal. Number three, class size. Which scale are we talking about here? Class size, number three. Ratio. Yes, we seem to agree on that. Somebody said ordinal, okay. Uh, class size is very specific. Uh, we seem to also have an absolute zero of a class size because we do have uh, class sizes that could be negative. Could we? Could we have a class size that's negative? <laughs> so that's the question for the person who said ordinal for number three. Um, but most of you seem to, to agree it is ratio. Now, you know, when we say most of us agree or the most popular thing, that is actually in statistics, it's called inter-rater reliability, that two or three people can look at one thing and say the same thing. Then we know that the answer is reliable, okay? So we are seeing a lot of people saying ratio scale so that our inter-rater inter reliability is quite high on that, okay? Then... Um, Number four, length of infants. So when you measure somebody's height, what kind of scale are we talking about? I had even given that on a previous slide. So for number four, some of you didn't even answer number four, only a few of you. And I think you're right. All of you who answered number four, you say it's ratio scale. Yes. Uh, number five, when you're given a matriculation number, maybe on the graduation day and you are lined up and you're just told, okay, you're gonna sit on, on chair number five. Does it mean anything? <laughs> no, it's just a nominal skill. So you got that right, number five. I don't think anybody wrote a different answer for number five. So very well done. You've all done well and let's proceed. I can see you're quite a lot. So the importance of measurement, again, I had already said earlier, it informs the way you design your instrument. It hints at how you collect the data, what you want to do with the data. And remember that if you have quantitative variables, when you're doing data collection, don't categorize them. For example, I find a lot of people doing m and and you go out to the field and you're asking people for the age ranges. It's better to ask people for the actual age and even add, add another question on date of birth because at the time of data analysis, you may want to know age at the time of data collection. So it's good to get the specific information without grouping it at the beginning so that later on you can use this discrete data to manipulate in different ways. So don't just categorize it when at data collection stage because it will make it harder for you to analyze when you start to want to know each participant's responses. So now we are in the analysis proper. We say there were two types of analysis. Does anybody remember the difference in descriptive and inferential? Let's just see if we are paying attention. <laughs> so we had already said, what is the difference between descriptive statistics and inferential statistics? Can anybody recall from the earlier slide or from your own knowledge? What's the difference between descriptive and inferential statistics? I'm trying to get it very interactive right now because I know we do have uh, a few people already digesting lunch if it is afternoon. <laughs> okay, so nobody remembers. Or I think you're still typing your answer. The difference between descriptive and inferential, anyone? Okay, you can check Dr. Google. 
is it is it written or just to show me no so so uh let's you can just type because of time i know you're so many and you're all typing so descriptive is more observational whereas inferential is more about linking okay yeah so inferential we said is to infer where you uh you take the representativeness of the sample to infer to a bigger population the reason we do sampling is because of inferential uh, basis we want to infer from a little sample what would be representative so if we took a little survey here and we said m and e students think something about something and then we can say that now we can generalize that to the whole population of all the m and e students in the world okay yeah thank you a lot more answers saying the same thing displaying information inferential is about conclusions yeah Descriptive is survey and quantitative, and inferential is qualitative, not quite. You can have any. But actually, when we talk about statistics, we're talking mostly quantitative data. So, Francis, we will not be having qualitative. This is not one of those uh, quantitative versus qualitative. It's, it's all quantitative, okay? So, descriptive is information on observable features. Yes, inferential explains why. Yeah, very well said. I like the explanations in here. Inferential is about drawing conclusion based on insights. Descriptive X is equals Y. Inferential, not necessarily. X is equals Y, but could be based on small samples, yes. Descriptive equals narrative, inferential is like a comparison. Okay, but descriptive is more observational, right? Yeah. Descriptive summarizes characteristics, inferential, and allows you to test the hypothesis. Yes, very good answer. Or assess whether your data is generalizable. That's exactly what we are saying. So we are really on the same, same footing. So we could also talk about now a different way of looking at um, types or levels of analysis, univariate, bivariate, and multivariate. So uni means single, bi like bicycle means two, and multi is three. So you can take three or more and just manipulate them together. And we are going to see some examples of those. I may not go into details on every single type of statistics, but I will actually give you examples. So what we what we mean when we say analysis there are several methods for manipulation of data one is tabulating you can definitely just take a summation score you add all the items in a survey response then there's another one called cross tabs that's a very popular one like if you want to do a chi square test you just relate two data items just take like maybe age we want to check people's age and their hair color okay maybe if it's a if it's a study on graying, like nowadays I see a lot of people, uh, their hair is graying when they are way young. Okay, so you can take age versus hair color. Then aggregating, uh, aggregation means building up, adding, adding up for the overall picture. Disaggregation is the opposite. So in aggregation, we are doing synthesis or summing up. Disaggregation, we are analyzing and breaking down, okay? Those are opposites. Then projecting, very important when you do models and you can forecast how indicators will change over time. We had a lot of projected uh, statistics mm -hmm. in during our COVID uh, lockdown global um, updates. And you would see all the time the WHO Secretary General talking about people need to be more careful, all coming out of statistics. So let's look at the first one. I know you're very familiar with central tendency, you remember what mean, mode, and median is. Those are some examples of univariate analysis. So one variable at a time, you just take a mean score. So, so earlier I had talked about salaries. We can take all the salaries of people in this room, including those with zero, and just put an average, and that's called the mean. Okay. Oh, somebody is drawing on the screen. We should be able to disable that. <laughs> Sorry. Then uh, examples are like frequency tables and all these measures of central tendency. That's a word that was coined in, again, 17th century Europe to talk about, you know, you remember the normal curve, the bell-shaped curve. So all of these happen to be in the center. So they are called central tendency measures. Those are just examples of univariate. Bivariate, two variables. I'd already talked about chi-squares and things like that, t-test, uh, correlation, regression. Then we talk about multivariate, three or more. You can have a multiple regression, logistic regression, log linear analysis, factor analysis. All these different factors can be put together. Uh, Shego Fatso, please stop drawing on the screen. Oh, somebody please help me. Post, please help me uh, disable that 
uh, thank you, multinomial analysis and so on. So if you can see the guide on the right, these kinds of thinking on your own theoretical anticipated relationships of the variables helps you select the best statistical formula. So out of your data, then you will know from your methodological approach how then to process it, which kinds of statistics you need to analyze it. So I'm just going to give you some examples really fast. So you can have an ANOVA when it's you know, a single independent variable. When we say metric, we mean that which can be measured, okay? So a non-metric independent variable with a metric dependent variable, you can have an ANOVA. You can talk about N-way analysis of variance. These are all examples of statistics. When you have a metric and a non-metric independent variable on a single metric dependent variable, it's called an analysis of covariance. Then when you have one metric independent on a single metric dependent, we call that bivariate regression analysis. And then we talk about other kinds of statistics, um, multiple regression, two or more metric variables. Um, on metric dependent variables, PSO correlation coefficient or PSO and product moment correlation coefficient, those are two metric variables. Then you can have metric and non-metric uh, dichotomous dependent variables. So don't worry about the big ones. These are just examples of statistics. So that will yield a binary logistic regression. But if you have more than two categories, that, that's a multinomial logistic regression. So those are some examples coming out of variables or statistics that you could use. Chi-squares are just about two categorical variables. Then if you have a metric dependent variable and a non-metric, like two categories of a non-metric, then you can do an independent t-test. Then if you have, if you want to measure in a pre-post test, the pre-measures and the post-measures, uh, of two metric variables, then we call that a paired t-test because uh, you're doing pre and then post, so you're pairing them. Then um, metric independent and a metric dependent that you want to check the importance. When we talk about importance, we're talking about statistical significance, so that's a beta coefficient. Then we have others like R-square, again, multiple uh, log linear analysis, three or more categorical variables. So the variable type here is categorical, so you can do a log linear ana analysis. Now, uh, for those who already um, know what an ANOVA is, a non-metric, a non-parametric alternative to that is a cruise called Wallis. And if you're doing an independent t-test, the non-parametric alternative is the Mann-Whitney test. And if you're doing a paired t-test, the non-parametric alternative is a Wilcoxon time ranked test. So these are all examples of different statistics. And you can see from this table, it started with the scale. You've got to identify, is this a nominal scale? For nominal scale, you can do a couple of statistics. And if you notice the last column on the ratio scale, you can do all the ones from the ones above. So it's that's a long list and you can add a couple more coefficient of variation and so on and so forth. So appropriate statistics accumulative to the higher the skill level is, you know, uh, all kinds of statistics can be allowed in the ratio scale. So you look at your variables, then you decide, okay, which is the best statistical method that I need to use for, to actually make this data uh, uh, make meaning when it's processed into information. Then finally, we talk about p-values. They are often used a lot to promote credibility for studies. Uh, and you see government agencies, for example, the US Census Bureau will stipulate that if you have any p-value greater than 0 0.1, it must be accompanied by a statement that the difference is not statistically different from zero. So this is all about you know, probabilities or likelihoods. And so we want to check standards for what is acceptable, you know. Uh, scientists are holding a lot of important government data and they've got to tell us how credible or statistically significant this data is. So what is a p-value? It's a statistical measure used to determine the likelihood that, that an observed outcome is the result of chance, okay? So when we talk about statistical significance, now you remember this bell curve, and you can see that we have a space that is the significance level where there is actually the observed value and what is expected. So there's a 
set outside of this bell curve that is very unlikely. So when we talk about probability of observation, at the highest point, we know that is most likely going to be observed. Then we say that's the true value under the null hypothesis, okay? So at the x-axis, those are all the possible results. So this is really interesting because when we start to interpret statistical results, we want to say, if we have very strong evidence against the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative, then it means uh, if you look at the statistics, the p-value will be below or equal to 0 0.01. If you have slight or moderate evidence against the null hypothesis, uh, then it will be between 0 0.01 and 0 0.05. And then if it's a little bit more suggestive evidence uh, or higher evidence, it's between, uh, I mean, less, this is less, um, evidence, it's between 0 0.05 and 0 0.1. But if the p-value is above 0 0.1, then there's little or no real evidence against the null hypothesis. In other words, uh, the data is consistent with the null hypothesis, you know. So that is uh, just uh, a way to kind of sum up how we look at all these data sets and how do we interpret that. But nowadays, we don't have to do it manually you already know that there are quite a number of softwares. I don't know if you're familiar with all these different softwares and their roles, their different roles in data analysis. I'm sure you've seen some, others you have never seen. So nowadays you don't have to do everything manually. These softwares, if you understand what you're doing with your data, they can help you to do it quite fast. Stata, MATLAB, ISPSS, Atlas TI, Minitab, NVivo. So, uh, which is the simplest machine you ever used to compute numbers? Perhaps it was your fingers or some sticks and stones. I don't know if any of you used those <laughs> or you only use um, pencil and paper, but we talk about the calculator. Yeah, a lot of you have used the calculator. There is also um, the slide rule was used a lot, especially in military circles uh, before you know the invention of all of these software. And so... SPSS, which is statistical package for the social science, is just one of those that's more still quite manual. Some of them are programming languages like Python, highly sophisticated, and uh, you can uh, compare all of these things if you look up on the internet. Uh, this is definitely not the current version. We've gone much higher than this. They're always being invented and the versions have version numbers. So in summary on data analysis, before we go to reporting, we can say that data serves as the building blocks of all statistical analysis, can be classified as quantitative or qualitative. And today we've mostly zoomed in to quantitative data. And scales of measurement enable you to choose appropriate statistics. So when we say nominal data, we're talking about just categories. Ordinal data is arranged uh, in order. Interval data, you can make Mean, uh, calculate meaningful differences between observations. And the ratio data has all of this, plus the additional capacity of expressing one observation as a multiple of another. You can do multiplication division. So we have many types of data analysis, descriptive, inferential, and we have levels of analysis, which we've looked at briefly, univariate, bivariate, and multivariate. So that's about it on the analysis side. And now I want to switch gears to the reporting side. Feel free to um, uh, note down any questions or comments you have as I swing through to reporting. Uh, just a reminder, we will look at different things in reporting. Uh, what is reporting? Why is it important? How to do it? And I'll go really fast because this is also just uh, for most of us, uh, mostly just to check where we are with you know reporting and what which are the different sections and when is the best time to do m and e reports you know some best practices on that and who is responsible you know you, you know we know the pm or the program manager usually the person who really has to do reports and so we are going to look at all of these things reporting is the responsibility of the project management team to provide formal updates to the project's founder. Okay, I already see comments on data analysis. Yeah, keep them coming and any questions will also be noted. So now reporting is also a tool for accountability. It helps any funder to know how the 
team is making progress towards the project goals. Okay, so reporting is a communication tool. It provides information. It is also a product. So most of the time you'll see it in nice, flashy graphic emo infographics and uh, tables and uh, also a nicely written summary, which, you know, those contents are dependent on the context of the project document or the or things we call TOR, terms of reference, you know, program document or strategic plan. So remember, effective reports have to be user-friendly, results-based, donor-engaging, audience-driven, and it has to be an accurate window of what's happening at the site level. Uh, in Kenya, we say things gone round. You really have to report what you actually can see. And that's really important for reporting. So I'm not going to go into all these definitions. You already know what indicators, outputs, outcomes, impacts, baseline, monitoring, evaluation, logic model, all of these things, you know, the glossary of terms that we use in M&E. But why is M&E reporting important? You want to keep people better informed give information on strengths and weaknesses of the project. This information helps for better planning of future projects. Um, gone are the times when we used to fear the person who does M&E coming to, to compile information for a report. A lot of organizations would go hiding. But if you do it in a really, you really slow down and do it in a very uh, uh, inviting style that gets everybody to build together a way an accountability structure, it really promotes transparency. And we know that that actually shifts the needle on things like corruption. When we have more transparency and accountability, which is very needed, you know, and obviously we have to tell the story in order to engage, persuade, and refine goals to promote success. So obviously we will be able to enable adaptation, better planning, learning, exchange, accountability, and information. So how often do we do reporting? You'll find that monitoring can be done on a more regular basis. Think of a trip where a vehicle has to go through different bumps. And have you ever seen how like, if you're driving on the road and you encounter a bump, you really have to slow down, right? and approach the bump and tackle the bump. So at every point, you know, it's good to check how we are doing with the trip. But if you think about the analogy of the trip again and an evaluation, evaluation is really checking. So from, for instance, Nairobi, and we wanted to go to Cape Town, Cape Town did we end up in Cape Town? Was that the end result? Or did we end up going to Cairo instead? You know. <laughs> So evaluation is done at the start, at the middle, and at the end, checking for outcomes. So that's the difference. So who does M&E reports? Monitoring is mostly done internally by the people on the gr uh, ground, the program staff members. But evaluation, most of the time, will be done by external consultants. Sometimes you'll find uh, internal staff members also doing evaluation. But when it is said to be more effective is when somebody from outside can come and just collect all these indicators and give a report. So that's why most of the time they will hire an external evaluator. What's the impact of poor report writing? I thought this was an interesting slide to include because you know, reports have many audiences and the first one, the biggest beneficiary and initial audience is the project manager themselves, the person who writes the report. Aside from the PM, you always have clients, and this might be clients or sponsors, okay, the people who are actually funding the process, okay. Then you have other colleagues, you always have peers uh, who will be able to check and see how reports are being done. Managers, and this one is interesting because there's a level of critique, there's a level of evaluation of the reports themselves. And then uh, in the research field, we talk about institutional review boards like IRBs, uh, IRECs, and ethic review boards. Then we talk about QA. Many organizations have a quality assurance office, and that's why you'll mostly see the M&E uh, team. Then regulatory authorities, this could be both national or global. And there's a lot of pressure now, especially in the NGO world, to check closely on the monitoring process itself. Uh, did you see um, a lot of elections now have election observers, for example? Okay. So in addition to the actual program 
activities, there are some observers who are also observing the observers, okay? <laughs> so in other words, now, a lot of organizations are trying to avoid warning letters from inspectors of these regulatory authorities or avoiding bad reviews because sometimes it's about reputational management. So you find them also getting, you know, the audience of a regulatory authority so that they can, yeah. So if you have a poor report, then all these people will be weighing in and there's definitely a risk there. So how do we do report? We just need to in, in, uh, identify the indicators to be monitored and evaluated, uh, develop data collection tools, collect the data, analyze the data. Then we compile this report and use the findings to iterate. Iterate means going back and going uh, using the backward design, going back to the project activities to see what we need to change. So here are the sections. Usually you can start with a preamble or a title page. Your title page is very simple. It just has the name, the dates covered, the basic forecast, you know, you always put the company logo there just, you know, for proprietorship and table of contents is always good for that kind of, you know, just helping people navigate your document. But uh, nowadays reports can be as short as one page or one and a half pages. So not all these sections are essential, okay? So, um, then in your table of contents, you will also include all these things. Executive summary, which is also like a preamble. Sometimes, uh, so what I've put in italics is not essential. A preamble is just some context on the intended use and the users and who is included and excluded and who, who this applies to and who it may not apply to or who you are and who the report is for, basically. But there are essential uh, sections like the introduction where you describe the program, the objectives or the purpose or the focus. Then of course, methodology. How did you go about uh, collecting information? Which kinds of methods did you use? Were they focus group discussions or what kinds of IDIs, you know, and all that. And then findings or the results achieved. And you can even talk about under findings. Some people add a section called causes. So you kind of want to explain a little bit. But typically that you can put at a separate section called discussion. Again, discussion is not essential. Uh, conclusion is quite an essential section because there is where the voice of the uh, program manager is heard. Your opinions can also come through because then you'll be talking about lessons learned. And some people also put lessons learned under recommendations. And because you got to start from lessons learned to the recommended action. So that's basically how a report looks like. Your executive summary is very brief. And remember, a lot of people don't have time to read reports. So keep it short and sweet, okay? So they, that acronym called KISS. Uh, some people say, keep it short, stupid, but I thought that was a bad uh, <laughs> phrase. So I, I like the keep it short and sweet instead. So please remember that people don't have time and it's good to always include an executive summary uh, at the beginning of your report. As I say, the preamble is not uh, a must, but sometimes you may be needing to add it, especially if your report has different audiences, so as to explain who is the best target audience for that report to remove any confusion or doubt if there is any. Your background section, just giving a little context, a little narrative description, theory of change, you know, purpose and scope and so on and so forth. Then your methodology, this is where you really indicate uh, data sources and methods, which indicators and performance measures did you use? What was your evaluation design or rationale? Uh, why did you decide to select the methods you selected? Credibility of the data sources. Um, which methods did you use to collect data and analyze it? How did you select a sample? Which types of respondents did you have if you can group them? And also, it, if it um, increases the value of your report, you can attach the data collection instruments used like the FGD2, for example, as the appendix. Then, the gist of the M&D report is really the results. You really have got to say in statement form, what is the story? So actually, what did you find? So think of this section like the ingredients of the meal. So really, you really have to put out what was actually found. And in this case, you may not highly analyze it. You just want to put that in due diligence, just really listing what you found. 
uh, what was the meaningful and wholesome result. Remember, you don't have to write everything. You write what is most uh, impactful for the purpose of driving the conversation. Um, so you can see, for example, you'll be able to put tables like this. This is a log frame and uh, the first table there and the second table has a few changes in their uh, columns. You can see there, you can put a project summary, indicators, means of verification and risks or assumptions. Or you could decide to say project summary, indicator, baseline, and then results achieved. And then what was the percentage change? So that's really results driven. It really shows what actually moved. And it's okay to include all kinds of graphics as we said earlier and infographics and tables in your report. It helps summarize the findings very well. So you've got to arrange those findings in order for them to make logical sense. What were the inputs? Remember our story of the crow? What were the activities? What were the outputs? What were the outcomes? What was the purpose or the goal? And so all of those things will be really important as you are reporting the finding. Then we have conclusions. So what actually can you uh, conclude if you synthesize all of these findings? This is really where the voice of the, and opinion of the project manager comes in. You've got to summarize the answers to the original questions without repeating the facts, okay? So you say it in other words, bring it all together, highlight the most important point, elaborate if you need to, so that to make those really important highlighted points then um, definitely the recommendations, which is coming from lessons learned. Remember we say lessons learned may be a separate subsection or it might be under either conclusion or recommendation. So in recommendation is actually what are the lessons learned and then what are the actions subsequent that are recommended? What are proposals for future action and who will be responsible for those kinds of things? So you need to focus on improving the relevance, the performance and the success of the project. And it's good to begin with a strong action verb and don't restate the conclusions. Try to put it in uh, different words and summarize the evidence and indicate who is responsible, who is supposed to act. Also suggest different avenues for implementation. So remember, if you're trying to write recommendation, you've got to think about each conclusion. So for it to have a logical flow, each conclusion was derived from several results. So maybe result A and result B formed one conclusion and results C and result D another conclusion. And so the recommendation has got to follow that logical order, you know, per conclusion, which has uh, also arranged results. So it has got to be clear, specific. Uh, it's good to cluster related recommendations. That makes you look organized and professional. And if you have any delicate issues, try to treat them sensitively. Um, many times you're entering organizations where the M&E report will cause a transformation. So you've got to really specify the potential benefits for the impact if each recommendation is actually implemented. There are costs if you implement some changes, some transformation in organizations, but it's also good to also show the benefits, okay? So just some tips, follow the standard format. Most of the time you'll find um, there are specific needs for your audience, but don't overlook cross-cutting issues. So a lot of times, uh, especially during COVID, we had to really adapt our M&D reporting to really show the impact of COVID during the time of data collection and things like that. Even though they were not part of the initial plan, COVID is something that came that disrupted a lot of, you know, work that was being done. It's just an example, okay? Then obviously you've got to tabulate your results alongside the log frame. Everything has got to be aligned and connected. Be concise, straight to the point. It's good to, to use a grammar checker like Grammarly just to check that your report is insightful. Remember some of these reports get posted online and there are organizations which only just hire people to do reports. So you can do it in an excellent way, use infographics, a lot more colors and videos and articles and brochures, graphs and charts and make it catchy because people don't have time to go through all the words on slides, okay? Then be balanced, mention positives and negatives and you know, uh, it's also good when you finish writing the report to circulate it for comments. Don't just present it uh, to the person. 
that have hired you. Also get some reviews and work on each and every comment and proofread your work. Uh, avoid plagiarism. It's always good to cite where you've got any information from because this is a collective work. Remember the organization graced you with all this information about their project, which you are evaluating or you are monitoring. So when you submit the draft, um, um, uh, we want to have a sort of a dissemination uh, strategy. So you might think about which communication method. Will I put it on a poster or will I do a two page summary or a uh, PowerPoint slide presentation or I'll just talk orally presenting the result. And it depends on which audience, okay? So for example, you might say, okay, to program participants, these are beneficiaries in the field. I may only need an oral presentation, but if I'm talking to the staff in my office, I may need some slides with some technical information. But if I'm talking to managers, they only need to know what they should do at the executive leadership C-suit level, right? And if you're talking to donors, again, you shift around your communication method and the style of your report so that um, to achieve the most effective, you know, priorities. So you've got to know your audience. That's definitely demographics and psychographics. Psychographics is how they think. Why are they here? What keeps them up at night? What are their pain points? How can you solve the problem? What do you want them to do? A good report will move people from point A to point B. How can you best reach them? And how may they resist your recommendation? The resistance part uh, we've seen a lot, but now we are seeing more organizations embracing M and E uh, professionals. And please avoid these errors. If you make it too long, too much jargon, key hags are very, very hard to find. You're reporting too much data, even non-essential data. Those are some errors. Those are some things to avoid. You're missing a window of opportunity where you can elaborate on what is important. Maybe too much narrative. You're too verbose, okay? or you are ignoring the report design. There's always a standard format that you can use. So in summary, reporting meets the needs of all those involved without duplicating efforts. For example, you can, uh, instead of writing a formal evaluation report, you can replace it or just complement it by you contributing to the monitoring reports that are already there internally. So if you're an external evaluator, you don't have to always write an evaluation report. You can just ask for their monitoring reports that they've been doing internally and just, you know, or do a real-time mini evaluation. So you've got to decide on a case-by-case -case basis what is the most impactful thing, remember, coming out of the target audience directly. Thank you so much for your kind attention, and I'll be happy now to take any questions or comments. Great, thank you, Dr. Wangari, and um, thanks everyone for listening. We'll take it up in um, uh, this format. We'll start by looking at the chat. So I don't know, June, are you still there? I have been having challenges, so my chats are not okay. uh, are not okay. detailed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Time. I'll let best to go through the charts. Then after that, we'll check the the hands. Then our facilitator will be able to respond. Then after that, we'll make some announcements, and then we should be able to finish. Um, I also got challenge. I only have two from Edith. Um, uh, I think there's a comment timely masterclass and very insightful session. This from Edith. Uh, thinking I was a PhD class, <laughs> I did graphs all, but uh, the same. I thank you all for the experience. Please, IPMS, I think this is one of the campuses. Can we have our postgraduate sessions done more comprehensively, like this masterclass? Sante Sana. Um, those are the two I was checking. I I didn't see any issue that was uh, glaring. I think uh, uh, everybody is just happy that the session went very well. So let's give a, a time for those who want to raise their hands to raise an issue with the, with the good doctor here. So this is your chance to raise your hands. Who goes first? You want to ask a question? Yes, uh, Mude, you can go first. 
Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you all facilitators. I cannot name from starting uh, in the morning. Uh, Chase, I would like to, to get uh, the clarification of uh, what time this uh, master program will start. And uh, happily, I, I'm one of the students from Somalia who received the uh, postgraduate diploma of monitoring evaluation. But now I'm uh, seeking to promote or enhance my knowledge uh, into a master's degree as the webinar was uh, all about. But um, I'm just seeking only the time as well as the modalities. Uh, is the master is the same as we did online or uh, there will be, it will be online, but is it the same as the postgraduate or there will be some other different modalities? Uh, I'm here to, to sharpen my knowledge. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Mark uh, can answer that. Ma master. <laughs> master classes are are topical they, they are simply we pick out specific topics like if you look at today we were looking at theory of change and the log frame now we're looking at data and of course we brought in our regular moderator to look at the introduction to m and d so next master class we look through um uh we'll pick a topic and i think the topic was actually partly introduced today is something to do with outcome harvesting. So we'll be looking at how to uh, pipe your outcomes and so that they can be able to be beneficial to you. They can be able to look at the sphere of influence for your projects so that you know whether your project is the one that's contributing to the change that you're seeing in the community. So look forward to the next masterclass. They are small, they are just one day and they have very experienced uh, professors coming to teach. So they, please um, just hang in there. We will be able to notify you when the next one is coming. They, they, are, they are actually must be approved by, by the Senate and they go through a lot of process before this is done. Um, then advertisements are made and then people pay payments before the masterclass is announced. So, but the next one will be announced soon. Uh, you're welcome. Anybody else? I saw Francis Oma, one of our old students, saying this was very insightful. Everybody else is very happy. Any other hand that I can see before I give Dr. Wangari a chance to make her final closing remarks? Faith, go ahead. Edith, sorry, Edith. Thank you so much. I know I've already commented, but I just wanted to say uh, something. Um, thank you all. I really appreciate this masterclass. I had put a comment, and I know you mentioned that AI PMS may be one of the branches for Strategia Netherlands, but I, I really wish that can be taken up because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a student there, and I'm a, I think in my very last semester of study, but the experience is quite different. And I feel if we can adapt this, then I think for the people that are coming after us, would it would really be, I think, a more, a better experience if that can be given as feedback to them. Thank you. All right, I think the, 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 there's just a collaboration between IPMS and the Strategia Netherlands and a number of other universities and colleges across the world. Uh, but we cannot influence really how they, they do their thing. But um, I think your point is was well taken, Edith. Anybody else? Washua? Washua Hassan? What is your Dr. question? Ma, yes. Uh, while Washua is coming through, there's a question from. Karamoko, what is right. performance report? Performance report. Let's uh, give our facilitator a chance to respond to that. Yeah, thank Dr. you Okan. so much. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm actually listening to all the comments and uh, it looks like a lot of us followed. Uh, 
what we are talking about so far and we are asking for more. So that's a really good thing. So a performance report is a report on performance. <laughs> so basically they are routinely produced, especially when you need to check if something is being uh, done efficiently, usefully, you know, it's a document that will define and measure the overall success. So if you want to check how, for instance, a business is performing, you check, you address the outcome of the activity and the work of the individual or the business, then of course you'll have to have actual outcomes uh, and and their, uh, then data analysis really on what was the expected and what was the actual outcome. So uh, performance reports uh, in project management will be useful because you use them to, uh, to check what is expected to happen in a project. So you can predict future performance or expected status of a project from a from a project from a uh, performance report, so um, this provides management with a lot of information on making decisions. So basically, any company can have just a documentation on their projects, product services. We find that, especially for smaller businesses, most of them don't have. They operate very informally. Think about the small duka or tiny shop, you know, where you buy probably your groceries. Some of those small businesses don't have, but larger organizations do have substantial exhibits of the work they are doing from time to time and they want to check, uh, you know, things like business cash flow, growth, overall status, you know. And uh, it's good to, when, when, when uh, doing um, uh, your project uh, report, to ask for performance reports because they inform what you're going to be compiling in project management uh, reporting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doc. I, I, I think that um, we've done justice to our afternoon. I know yesterday mm -hmm. we were speaking, you said your worried the energies would be so low, but uh, everybody kept uh, going. And um, I believe we will also tweak the hours next time we have our masterclass so that yeah. we can be able to. So this is quite heavy and this is useful. Data is mm -hmm. actually what drives implementation. Data drives decision making, and uh, analyzing it correctly and uh, helping our students to be able to get a mastery edge over what they're doing when they come to data is very useful. So, I want to thank you very much sincerely on, on behalf of the global director and our affiliates that we're working with for putting this together. We want to thank you sincerely together with the other facilitators who are still in, in session, Job, Kenua, and uh, Jenny, who is our regular uh, uh, lecturer. We hope that uh, we can be able to meet with you next time when we have our next webinar, uh, which we plan to do. We'll be looking at uh, outcome harvesting. And we, you can spread the word, spread the word. We tend to see how we can have a huge community in uh, m and and uh, Strategy in the Netherlands will be always there to uh, bring to you these sessions. I All right, thank repeat. you. I've seen, I've seen a question on an example of an m and &E questionnaire analysis using SPSS. Unfortunately, we don't have time to do that. But remember, data is data. So the way you would just uh, analyze data from research is the same you do for data from m and &E. uh, and SPSS, uh, there are so many YouTube videos. Maybe I'll refer you to checking how to do that from watching uh, videos online. But there are so, I mean, right now I may not be able to do a practical demonstration on how to do analysis. And yeah. it also depends on which data set you have. So <laughs> please feel yeah, free I know, to consult. I know, I know mm -hmm. the, 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 most of our students who are actually doing their capital project or their, their projects, and they have to gather some data and, and analyze. We don't expect you to do that yourself. You can actually outsource that service and then get yourself sorted out and you get the data analyzed. But when it comes to interpretation, we expect you to interpret it yourself and be able to present it in a, a format that uh, we can be agreeing on. So with those uh, many remarks, just want to check if Job, are you still in the house? Job Kinu? Jenny, are you still in the house? Great, so thank you very much. See you again. I want just to let you know that uh, if you did not 
write your name correctly in the manner in which you would want it to appear in your certificate. Uh, write an email immediately to the academic email, then you can be able to have your name. So we are going to exit at uh, the sound of some music from our ICC team and see you soon next time. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Dr. Wanda. Welcome. Well, welcome. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye and thank you. Oh, John, 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 you are there. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, <laughs> this video, the recording will be on our YouTube channel from tomorrow afternoon. So if you miss something, please uh, visit our YouTube channel, Strategy Netherlands, and uh, there are about uh, 56 other videos. So there's a lot of content there. And right. uh, please refer other people. Thank you very much, Mark, for the yeah. moderation. And Dr. Wangari, thank you. And June, thank you for facilitating the, uh, the Q&A. Most welcome, John. <laughs> thank you. All right. Good.